our program shortly so if you um, may take your seat
Good morning, everyone. Uh, we hope everyone is having a good morning. Uh, may we ask everyone to take their seats as we are going to start the program soon? Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, pleasant morning to everyone. I am Erika Siosan of the Culture and Information Division of the ASEAN Secretariat, and I will be your MC for today. Before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the members of the Committee of Permanent Representatives. His Excellency, Mr. Ekafab Fantabong, uh, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN for ASEAN Social Cultural Affairs. His Excellency, Mr. Kwon Hee Sok, Ambassador of the Mission of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN, His Excellency Mr. Tryu Min Long, Director General of International Cooperation Department, Ministry of Information and Communications of Vietnam, who is joining us online, and His Excellency Dr. Kam Suk Kevong Sai, Director General, National Institute of Fine Arts, Ministry of Information, Culture and Tourism of Lao PDR. Today we celebrate ASEAN identity and explore what it means for us. We have come a long way since the founding of ASEAN in 1967 and the development of the narrative of ASEAN identity in 2020. And today's symposium would not have been possible without the support of the Republic of Korea through the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund. The symposium is the kickoff event of a multi-stakeholder conversation that may lend various perspectives to efforts in amplifying ASEAN awareness and fostering ASEAN identity. Before we officially start our program, allow me to briefly explain some housekeeping rules. Uh, please be mindful and be aware of your surroundings while inside this premise. Restroom uh, is located outside of the Nusantara Hall uh, in my uh, right side. In emergency situation, please do not use the elevators and walk calmly using the stairs and proceed to the area outside of this building. Now please have a look around and locate the green exit signs. Please follow the exit signs in case of emergency. Thank you for your attention. Now please rise for the ASEAN Anthem. Before we commence the program, please allow the Abang None Jakarta to welcome us with a cultural performance.
Thank you to Abang None Jakarta for that wonderful performance. Now let us all listen to His Excellency Dato Lim Jok Hoy, uh, Secretary General of ASEAN, for his opening address. Excellency Kwang Hee Sok, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN, Representative of SOMKA and SOMRI, fellow panelists and participants, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Symposium on ASEAN Identity and Strengthening ASEAN Republic Korea Cooperation, now and beyond. At the outset, I would like to extend my appreciation to ASEAN Member States and Republic Korea for organizing this event in collaboration with the ASEAN Secretariat. I also would like to express my gratitude to the Republic of Korea for the support in making this symposium possible. As a valued strategic partner of ASEAN, there is much we can learn from Korea on awareness raising and identity building. Their knowledge and experience can help us with our own endeavors in fostering ASEAN identity. Over 55 years, ASEAN community building efforts have been steadily gaining momentum with support from our people and external partners. Despite the trying times caused by COVID-19, our work to enhance ASEAN awareness and foster a regional identity among ASEAN people have continued. However, this effort has not been without challenges. Based on the survey response, there is still much work ahead of us that we need to do in order to inspire the people in our region to identify themselves as ASEAN citizens. The poll on ASEAN awareness commissioned by the ASEAN Secretariat in 2018 shows that while 96% of respondents are aware of ASEAN, less than a third of them know much about the ASEAN community building process. ASEAN has carried out activities to promote ASEAN awareness and identity under the ASEAN Communication Master Plan 2018-2025. In reaching out to the public, we have produced a suite of digital contents including the ASEAN 101 video series, the ASEAN Champion podcast, web tones and publication such as the In Conversation with ASEAN Citizen. We also designated 2020 as the year of ASEAN identity with a regional logo design competition that attracted more than 1,300 entries. Furthermore, I am pleased to note that ASEAN has attracted a strong following on various social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube the majority of whom are from Southeast Asia. Notably, the ASEAN website has generated at least 12 million visits annually, which translates to 33,000 users daily. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, having shared some of the development of our work in advancing ASEAN identity, I would like to share some views and suggestions that may be a source of discussion during this symposium. First, the maintenance of regional peace and security and stability and the subsequent economic growth and development of ASEAN member states are the foundations in which ASEAN identity rests upon. The fact that there have been no interstate conflicts involving casualty between our two or more ASEAN member states is a testament to our collective commitment in preserving our friendship and good neighborliness. Furthermore, our progress on economic integration has led us to the realization of the ASEAN economic community, which has brought ab about shared prosperity and economic development. Therefore, amidst geostrategic uncertainties and sluggish gl global economic growth, ASEAN cannot afford to be complacent. We need to be constantly vigilant in maintaining peace 
and prosperity in an evolving environment and to remain relevant. ASEAN will need to project leadership and pursue initiative to maintain its centrality. ASEAN identity can only be promoted if all of this continues to be in place. Secondly, generating ASEAN awareness remains critical in fostering ASEAN identity. While we should, have, we should draw a distinction between awareness building and identity fostering, the two are closely linked, and I believe that we still have some way to go until ASEAN mechanism and processes become common knowledge among our people. As such, our education system play an important role. I understand that information regarding ASEAN is already incorporated in school and higher education curricula across the region, and I welcome more efforts to enhance this. The culture and creative industry are another key avenue to disseminate information about ASEAN, including its rich history and heritage. I urge the symposium to consider a more innovative way to expand our people's awareness of ASEAN. Thirdly, we should increase our efforts towards generating greater exchanges and intra-ASEAN mobility. One such, one, one success of the EU fostering a European identity is the establishment of the Schengen area which allow EU citizens and residents to live, work and travel in EU countries without going through controls at internal borders or do they have to pay the telephone roaming charges. Whilst ASEAN has no current plan to establish its own Schengen area, the EU example illustrates how greater exchanges and in inter-regional mobility can certainly help towards cultivating a shared identity. I therefore support efforts to increasing ASEAN exchanges and visits at all levels from the public sector to the grassroots. It is also my hope now that with the reopening of ASEAN member states, intra-ASEAN tourism will return to a pre-pandemic figures. The last thing I would like to raise is actually, actually a question which I would like to extend to all of you. What makes you proud to be an ASEAN citizen? One answer which resonates with me is when we witness our fellow ASEAN nationals achieve excellence on the international stage, whether it is in sport, the entertainment industry, or in arts, feeling pride and joy at the success of other ASEAN citizens is a clear demonstration that you feel a strong affinity and sense of belonging with people from other ASEAN member states. In your deliberation, you might come up with different answers but it is worth hearing all of them. In that spirit, I wish you all a fruitful exchange of views and ideas on how we can amplify ASEAN awareness and foster ASEAN identity as we work towards building ASEAN as a community of opportunities for all. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency Dato SG, for your uh, very inspiring opening address. Uh, now, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Mr. Kwon Hee Sok, Ambassador, Mission of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN, to give the welcome remarks. Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to extend my warm welcome to all of you to this symposium, uh, which is organized by the ASEAN Secretariat and supported by the Republic of Korea uh, through the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund. I would also like to extend my profound uh, gratitude to His Excellency Dato Lim Jokhoi and His Excellency Ambassador Ekapap Pantabong and the Secretariat for presenting this meaningful event. Uh, just before this meeting, I had a chance to uh, converse with my fellow ASEAN ambassadors in this central table. But this is very typical and uh, philosophical subject, uh, which goes beyond our uh, daily languages, which we exchange with, such as maritime cooperation, green uh, development, um, digital transformation. Uh, this is a typical subject. But as soon as we refer to ASEAN identity, we immediately become a visionary figure. As I have traveled uh, to various countries in Southeast Asia over the years, I saw many differences in people, culture, religion, political and economic systems. Yet, I sensed that these differences are not so big. Rather, these countries and peoples possess much more common things, making them unique and distinct in the community of uh, nations. These countries are single political, economic, social, cultural entity, ASEAN. I feel you are already one community, not only in the language written in the ASEAN community document in 2015, but in daily lives and activities. And we have to consolidate and enrich this community. The community building is an evolving long-term journey. Today's symposium is a reminder of who you are, where you came from, and your, where you are heading for. ASEAN identity will create a stronger sense of a we feeling and ASEAN-ness and togetherness, which are essential to this building process. We work together to give the impetus to this process with a sense of a mission and responsibility to our citizens. In this process, the ASEAN Secretariat, I believe, plays a key role. A peaceful, stable, prosperous, and dynamic ASEAN is an immense plus to Korea, the region and beyond. The Republic of Korea will do our utmost to contribute to shaping ASEAN identity and the eventual one Asian community. One way Korea can contribute is to share the secret of uh, Korea's success in global cultural domain. The Hallyu Korean wave has uh, served as a cauldron of uh, further strengthening Korean identity. And this Hallyu is uh, very popular in ASEAN as well. I hope many of the uh, experts and eminent persons from media and arts and academics who know these uh, secrets, secrets will share their insights and ideas. I hope today's symposium will uh, deepen our understanding on ASEAN identity. Korea's role in strengthening ASEAN identity and facilitating contacts between ASEAN and Korea. Last but not least, the intimate sense of a one identity nourished among ASEAN member states will guide ASEAN through many challenges ahead as one community. Thank you. Terima kasih.
Thank you very much, Your Excellency Ambassador Kwon. Now let us welcome His Excellency Mr. Triu Min Long, Director General of International Cooperation Department of the Ministry of Information and Communications of Vietnam. He is joining us online. Your Excellency, Mr. Long, the floor is yours. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, can we ask you to unmute your mic? I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Lim Jok Hoi, Secretary General of ASEAN, Excellency Mr. Ek Kafa Pantavong, uh, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN, Your Excellency Mr. Kwon Hee Seo, uh, Ambassador Mission of the Republic of Korea to ASEAN, Excellencies, the distinguished colleagues and friends from uh, ASEAN and the Republic of Korea. It is a great uh, pleasure and honor for me on behalf of our colleagues in the uh, information sector to join this important event. ASEAN uh, has now become one of the most uh, successful regional organizations. ASEAN symbolized the spirit of solidarity and peaceful, prosperous, and socially responsible community. We are all proud to be members of ASEAN and proud to be the member of ASEAN family. We are proud, but we are also obliged to work more closely to foster and promote the ASEAN identity as uh, recognized under the uh, of ASEAN identity, it is critical to nurture the ASEAN identity by maximizing the opportunities provided by information and technological advancement, as well as social media. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, for the information sector, this is a challenging mandate, but also a great opportunity for us to carry out more initiatives, taking advantage of the digital technologies to realize our vision in all the three aspects. First, on ASEAN awareness, digital platforms will facilitate the access to information of our people, even in very remote areas now. Internet access is available across our region. In addition to using the social media, the ASEAN portal of ASEAN, the Secretariat and the National ASEAN portal of each ASEAN member states, we need to be more attractive with updated and useful information about ASEAN and should be a key source of information for our communication program on ASEAN identity. Second, for ASEAN relevance, ASEAN is recognized as one of the most successful uh, regional organizations because of its important role in the development of our prosperous and uh, peaceful community. The promotion of values and cultures of ASEAN and each member state will need to be uh, our top priority. So we need to provide more resources for the production and dissemination of ASEAN digital local contents so that 
670 million people in our region could benefit more from the integration and development of our community. Third, for ASEAN appreciation, the digital literacy and skills uh, could also empower our people and facilitate their contribution to the ASEAN identity, particularly for younger generations. Through digital platforms, they could be more engaged and more responsible when being part of this mission. In this regard, we, the officials in the information and digital sectors, we need to work together more closely and proactively to accelerate the process. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, the ASEAN identity is key to building our community. We appreciate the effort of ASEAN Secretariat in organizing this symposium. I wish to thank our colleagues from the Republic of Korea for sharing your views and experience uh, later in this symposium. Korea has been very successful in utilizing digital tools to promote national cultures and values in the country and across the world. So I hope we will have a very productive and fruitful symposium today. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Now let us welcome His Excellency Dr. Kam Silk Keo Vang Sai, Director General, National Institute of Fine Arts, Ministry of Information, Culture and Tourism of Lao PDR to deliver the opening remarks. Your Excellency, please. His Excellency Dr. Lim Jack Hoy, Secret General ASEAN. His Excellency Pekapa Pantawong, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN. His Excellency Won, Won Hee Song, Ambassador Missions of Republic of Korea, ASEAN. Excellency Jiang Min Long, ASEAN Summary Chair, Summary Leader of Vietnam. Honor guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to attend this important General Symposium of ASEAN Korea Identity Fostering. A shared identity now is beyond, which being honed on September 22, 2022. Firstly, please allow me to introduce myself. I am Dr. Kam Sukya Wong Sai. Director General of Lao National Institute of Fine Arts, Ministry of Information, Culture and Tourism of Lao PDR, and as an Athen Lao Samka leader, on behalf of ASEAN Samka Share, I would like to warmly welcome you all to the open ceremony of. ASEAN Lock, Identity Fostering a Shared Identity Now. Today, Symposium is discussed on the exchange idea on the way forward to amplify ASEAN awareness and foster ASEAN identity by on representative of academics, media, creative maker from ASEAN Rock and organized this. This project was planned to conduct in August 2020. It's due to 
the COVID-19 pandemic so that it finally can be organized by today, Excellency. The two-day symposium is to mark for implementing the narrative of the ASEAN visitors adopted at the 37th ASEAN summit by ASEAN leader. In particular, in this project, is also in this with the ASEAN strategic plan for culture and art, 2016-2025, as well as the ASEAN Rock work plan on cooperation in culture and art, 2022-2025. I also look forward to hearing our today. The meeting outcome to report the nine Samka plus uh, Korea with be veto born in the next month in Vientiane, Lao PDR. Lastly, may I wish our today meeting success with productive outcome and may I wish Excellency and all delegates happiness, good health, and successful your work. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency's Dato SG, uh, Ambassador Kwon, uh, DG Long, and Dr. DG Kebongsai for all your messages. Uh, we hope uh, your messages have inspired our delegates more to share their views on how to amplify ASEAN awareness and foster ASEAN identity. Now, uh, for our photo session, uh, we would like to invite His Excellency TSG Ekafab Fantabong, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kwon Hisog, his Excellency Dr. Kamsuk Kyovongsai and members of the CPR and our speakers for uh, the panel sessions to join us in front for the photo session. So please may I invite you, uh, Your Excellencies. For our speakers, please join our uh, Members of the CPR, Ambassador Kwon and DSG Ekafab in front.
Excellencies, uh, thank you very much for taking a photo with us. And thank you to everyone for your enthusiasm this morning. And for us to keep being this enthusiastic and uh, this awake, uh, we will take a short break. Uh, we are serving coffee, tea, and water outside the Nusantara Hall uh, in the right side near the lift. So please have some while we uh, take a break and we will resume at 9.50. For uh, Your Excellency's uh, DSG Ekafab Fantabong, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kwon Hisog, and Your Excellency Dr. Kamsuk Kevongsai, uh, we invite you to join us at the exhibition on the first floor. Uh, So we hope DSG Ekafab, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador, and Your Excellency Dr. Kamsuk can join us at the exhibition on the first floor to take some photos. For the delegates, uh, please have some coffee, water, and tea outside uh, at the Nusantara, uh, near the lift. And we will resume at 9.50. Thank you.
the shine in my eyes. Million people crossing two thousand miles away. Memories of history, rising hope and dignity. Let's change for a brighter day.
the shine in my eyes. Million people crossing, two thousand miles away. Memories of history, rising hope and dignity. Let's change for a brighter day. Shine in my eyes. Million people crossing, two thousand miles away. Memories of history, rising hope and dignity. Let's change for a brighter day.
uh, we would like to invite uh, the rest of the delegates to uh, come back inside Nusantara Hall. We will begin shortly. Okay. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, we hope you had a refreshing coffee break. Uh, may we please invite everyone back to their seats for us to continue with our program. So to officially begin the program, uh, allow us to present an overview of the regional efforts to amplify ASEAN awareness and to foster ASEAN identity. We have uh, prepared a video for you and uh, please enjoy this video prepared by the Culture and Information Division. What is ASEAN identity? Is it about beautiful performing arts? Or the tasty street food? Or is it about our rich cultural traditions and heritage? Or would you say it's about ASEAN community building? Does ASEAN identity reflect unity? Or does it reflect the strengths of diversity? The narrative of ASEAN identity, adopted in November 2020, describes ASEAN identity as a process of a social construct defined by a balanced combination of constructed values and inherited values. Constructed values are divine as values and deliberate intentions to develop an allegiance, to achieve an objective of a community. These values of ASEAN can be found in Article 2 of the ASEAN Charter, namely, respect, peace and security, prosperity, non-interference, consultation and dialogue, adherence to international law and rules of trade, democracy, freedom, promotion and protection of human rights, unity in diversity, inclusivity, and ASEAN centrality in conducting external relations. Meanwhile, inherited values are defined as values that the people of the Southeast Asia region ascribe to, which have been passed on for generations. This includes traditions, beliefs, values, customs, norms, rituals, ceremonies, culture and arts such as music, dance, writing, farming, culinary, healing practices, and more. These cherished values and heritage represent the spirit of a dynamic and pluralistic community in ASEAN. ASEAN has been taking steps to promote ASEAN identity through its communication and outreach efforts. Guided by the ASEAN Communication Master Plan 2, that aims to engender a collective sense of pride and deepen the regional sense of belonging. By engaging with citizens, to demonstrate the opportunities and benefits offered by the ASEAN community. We have come up with an exciting suite of communication outreach, such as in conversations with ASEAN citizens' publication, ASEAN Champion Podcast Series, 
ASEAN 101 video series and quiz that convey the work and achievements of ASEAN under its three community pillars and the benefits of regional integration for the ASEAN people. The Year of ASEAN Identity in 2020 Further developed and fostered a sense of belonging and shared identity among the people of ASEAN, especially the youths. Through the ASEAN Identity Logo Design Competition, ASEAN Identity is a work in progress and we enjoin you to take part in shopping it together. By embracing a culture of prevention, appreciating our diversity, promoting and celebrating our shared values, heritage and history, and being a responsible member of society, so as to create an ASEAN that is a community of opportunities for all. Find out more about ASEAN identity on the ASEAN website. Thank you. Uh, so to have a better understanding of the regional efforts in amplifying ASEAN awareness and fostering ASEAN identity, we have a short presentation to be delivered by Mr. Jonathan Tan. Jonathan is the head of the Culture and Information Division. Jonathan, please. A very good morning, uh, Excellencies, uh, Ambassador Kwan. Uh, thank you for gracing the opening ceremony and being with us uh, at this moment for this symposium as well. Uh, so once again, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Before we go into the panel discussion, um, I would like to invite you to take a quick poll uh, on a question that we are going to show uh, on the screen here. So we are asking this question, do you feel like you are a citizen of uh, ASEAN? So if I may just invite you to whip out your mobile phone uh, and then uh, capture the QR code and I think that uh, is also on your table as well. Um, and then um, respond to this question. Thank you. able to bring up the results or I don't see it being displayed. Ah, okay. Okay, so thank you for your responses. I think that um, you are a captive audience. Uh, very high sense of, uh, you know, feeling that um, you are citizens of uh, ASEAN. Uh, we have designed this not so much as a trick question, um, but we really play up the part about feeling because I think uh, at the very heart of the discussion today on ASEAN identity, um, there is really, it really speaks to the level of emotional attachment or affinity with ASEAN, in particular with ASEAN values and its vision as well. And therefore, you know, against this backdrop, we are asking this particular question here. Um, then uh, if I may just take another few moments to just walk you through uh, a few slides just to share with you what we think of ASEAN identity and um, that perhaps will help to frame the discussions among the speakers and the participants uh, after this. So I think, I think if I can, I will just start with 
what is not ASEAN identity? Uh, first thing, to be sure, it is not definitive. By that, what we mean is that um, there is no singular definition or framing of what ASEAN identity stands for. So in fact, sometimes um, if you look at, if you scrutinize our text, you will see that we don't affix an article like N or the before the ASEAN identity right? um, because we don't see that um, there is a singular definition. And um, another point that I think is very important to take note here is that it's not the same as uh, ASEAN awareness. Um, I, if you look at the Youth Development Index report that was released last year, uh, looking at the fifth domain, which is on the values, identity, awareness, about um, how the young people see ASEAN. Uh, one thing is clear is that as awareness of ASEAN has little bearing on having a shared ASEAN identity, nor does a shared sense of ASEAN identity imply greater knowledge or, or about uh, ASEAN. So in other words, um, for someone who has extensive knowledge about ASEAN, it doesn't really imply that they can identify readily with ASEAN. And you can say the converse is the same as the opposite is the same as well, which means that you may be able to identify readily with ASEAN. You feel that you're ASEAN citizen, but you know very little or have a uh, limiting understanding about ASEAN and its development. So I think that's, that's one point that we want to bring out here. Um, so that as you frame your discussions later on, um, you want to be mindful about the difference between awareness building and identity for fostering. So my second last slide. So what is ASEAN identity? I think what we wanted to say here is that it is a narrative, a work in progress. Um, as you can see in the program booklet given to you, we have actually put in the narrative of ASEAN identity. And it's called the narrative of ASEAN identity and not definition uh, for good reason, because we see that um, it is a story that continues to be told. And I think that it's very important that this speaks to the media participants with us because it alludes to the power of storytelling. And we want you um, perhaps to think about it during your breakout session later on, especially among our media professionals, how you can help us to shape the narrative of uh, ASEAN identity, telling the kind of stories or human interest stories that may interest people to better appreciate uh, ASEAN developments. The other point I want to make here is that it is an imagined community. So as you may be aware, um, the ASEAN community was uh, formally established in 2015 um, and um, is a community that we look at creating as a community of opportunities for all. Uh, but the question, as you can see, that we put to the plenary panel session one is that to what extent can we uh, transform this imagined community into reality? Then the third point here is that it's a process of a social construct, and this came very much out from the narrative of ASEAN identity. Um, and this social construct really here refers uh, very largely to the institutional values um, that have been espoused um, in this narrative of ASEAN identity. And of course, the other part of it is the inherited values, meaning to say the traditions, customs, belief, the shared history and heritage uh, of, of this region. And um, I think another point worth uh, noting here is that it's about the mindset, is the way of thinking. Right? Um, and I think that this question, this statement speaks more to how do we reach out to the youth and the young, given that they are the uh, builders of uh, tomorrow's ASEAN, for them to sh feel a greater sense of a shared future and destiny uh, of the region. And last but not least, and I think that is the most important, is about the we feeling, and that's why we asked that question. But I think that uh, related to this we feeling is the relevance. Um, asking the question like, how does ASEAN stay relevant to the people? Right? Um, and I think that's a very important question that we need to, need to answer. Because if it, if it becomes irrelevant, then I think the point about ASEAN identity discussion is moot. If I can just move to the last slide here, 
just um, reflecting what is already in the program booklet on the narrative of ASEAN identity. Um, as you can see there, um, it's written in such a way that you know, um, we look at it from con look at it as a set of constructed values and uh, inherited values. So for constructed values, um, it has actually gone, undergone three stages. So from the founding days in 1967, when the five founding members came together, and subsequently uh, with the rest of the five members joining um, the political aspirations, ambitions, as well as the desire to forge a common good for the region. So that would be the first stage. And the second stage is really the most prominent, uh, even up to now, because a lot of news that you read about ASEAN developments are about economic benefits, economic prosperity, economic uh, integration, right? And now we are looking at this part, uh, the third stage, which is on the softer side of things, which is the social and cultural values. And I think that there is a lot that we can learn from uh, our counterparts, uh, from the ROK, with the vibrant uh, Hayu uh, culture. And this is also something that we will speak about uh, later on. So if I can just move on, finally, to the inherited values, as you can see there, it's really what I mentioned earlier. It's the values that have been passed down uh, for generations and celebrating that uh, uh, diversity as a strength of our unity. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation. Uh, for today's program, uh, we will have two very interesting panel discussions in the morning, which will be followed by breakout sessions and a plenary discussion in the afternoon. So before we begin, let me share that for today's discussions, we will follow the Chatham House rules, which means that participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. In short, we encourage you to have very active and free-flowing conversation. So now, without further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce the moderator for panel discussion one on amplifying ASEAN awareness and developing ASEAN identity 55 years on. Dr. Tang siu Moon is a director of the Political and Security Directorate of the ASEAN Political Security Community Department of the ASEAN Secretariat. Dr. Tang, the floor is yours. Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished participants and colleagues. Thank you for joining us for our session on amplifying ASEAN awareness and developing ASEAN identity 55 years on. The awareness of and identification with ASEAN are at the very core of the ASEAN community building process, as our goal is to create a more integrated, resilient, and united community. However, as our experience in the past 55 years has shown, it is relatively easier to construct, to connect member states through the construction of airports, roads, and infrastructure, but it's entirely a different challenge to connect hearts and minds of our peoples. Specifically, how do we foster and develop a shared regional identity? What are the necessary conditions for this shared regional identity to develop and flourish? Is it possible to transcend and translate ASEAN as an institutional identity into one that resonates with the people. How would ASEAN's post-COVID-19 uh, identity look like? To answer these questions, we are delighted to have us a panel of four experts to help us unpack these questions and propose ways forward for us to inculcate and deepen our ASEAN identity. I would not be able to do justice to the illustrious uh, career highlights and the expertise of our panelists, 
but just allow me to present a very brief introduction of our speakers. To begin, uh, on my left, Mr. Sion uh, Sotarev is a Director General of Tech Techniques for Culture Affairs, Cultural Affairs at the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, Cambodia, and lecturer in Cambodian history and art history at the Royal University of Fine Arts. He's the author of a book entitled Pidan in Camera Culture. He undertook graduate work at the University of California at Berkeley and is currently completing his PhD dissertation entitled A Long Cambodian Tradition of Assisting the Date, a Historical and Ethnographical Study of Chum Ben. Uh, following on, uh, Professor Davy, Dr. Davy Fortuna Anwar is a leading public intellectual and a highly respected analyst, analyst and commenter, commentator of regional and global affairs. He is currently prof research professor at the Research Center for Pop Politics at the National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. She is also a member of the Indonesian Academy of Sciences and chairperson of the board of directors of the Habibi Center. One of the many highlights of Professor Davies' long-standing contribution to public service is a stint as Deputy Secretary to the Vice President of the Republic of Indonesia from 2010 and 2017. Welcome back, Ibu, to the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Hu Chiu Ping, who is Senior Lecturer in Strategic Studies and International Relations at the National University of Malaysia, University of Kabangsan, Malaysia. She is concurrently adjunct lecturer at the Malaysian Armed Forces Defence College. An expert on Korean politics and ASEAN security, she serves on the editorial board of the Amsterdam University Press Politics and International Relations in Asia series. And is a member of the Consultative Council on Foreign Policy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia. Her research interests revolves around Malaysia and Southeast Asian security issues. Last but not least, we are delighted to have with us Professor Dr. Melba Padilla Mage, who is a social anthropologist and is a sought-after international speaker and consultant on culture and social development issues, particularly on the interface of religion, culture and development. As a president of the Institute of Studies on Asian ASEAN Church and Culture, she has researched on cross-cultural and development studies at the Nagel Institute of the Study of World Christianity at Calvin College, Michigan, and at Yale University under the auspices of the Overseas Ministry Studies Center. She is also currently president of MICA Global, a network of 800 faith-based development organizations worldwide, where she serves as a resource person on culture and development issues. We welcome all our distinguished panelists, and as a reminder to each panelist, uh, we invite you to share your views uh, within the maximum allotted time of 10 minutes. And uh, I shall begin by inviting uh, in the, for the panelists to speak in the order presented in the program, beginning with Mr. Uh, Sion uh, Sop, uh, Sop, Soparev. Yeah, please. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Tan Shu Mung Nun, for allowing me to speak. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. Please allow me to, first of all, to express my sincere gratitude and ap appreciation for the organizing team, for your wonderful hospitality, especially the ASEAN Secret Secretariat, for extending the invitation to Cambodia Ministry of Cultures and Fine Art the Som and Somka Cambodia to take part in this important symposium on ASEAN identity, strengthening ASEAN rock cooperation now and beyond. I would like to also thank the Republic of Korea for actively support and engage in organizing the symposium. It is my great honor and privilege to have the opportunity to take part in this very important symposium and especially in in the panel discussion with our great panelists. I have discussed with all of them at the table. I see that we, I, I might not share much, but I learn more. That is what I, what I can predict. And also the great moderator, uh, Dr. Tan, here today to discuss the theme of 
um, amplifying ASEAN awareness and developing ASEAN identity 55 years on. The same is, as I believe, and also the many of the keynote speakers have presented this morning, to develop a way forward for the narratives of ASEAN identity approved for our ASEAN lead, approved by our ASEAN, our ASEAN leaders in its 37th ASEAN Summit in, in 2020. The year was designated as the year of ASEAN identity. The narrative the theoretically defined the ASEAN identity as a process of social construct defined by a balanced ba uh, combination of constructed values and inherited values. The, this definition paved the way for the practical development of ASEAN identity. We are here today to further elaborate and thoroughly discuss on this matter. Her Excellency Itso Piep, the Secretary of Cambodia Ministry of, Co of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, points out in her speech to technology. In her speech to high-level roundtable on a comprehensive and responsive ASEAN community 20, uh, 2020 reflection on bolder joint actions on the 17th December 2020, that while promoting ASEAN identity, we also need to ensure that all our peoples see the real benefits of ASEAN from them, thereby engendering our, uh, their participation in our community building, especially through ASEAN integration. I think the theme of our discussion, amplifying ASEAN awareness and developing ASEAN identity 55 years on, is also to address the concern raised by Her Excellency Itzo Piep. The theme comprises of two important interconnected components entailed. First, how are we to raise awareness of ASEAN among ASEAN people? Second, how are we going to identify or to develop ASEAN identities? It is the identity first or knowing ourselves first. Uh, to, to quote from Amita, Amita Acharya, I think that is the article can, can be found online, point out in his articles that the uh, uh, article, the evolution of limitation of ASEAN identity, that identity is function of two factors which are mainly sub subjective. One is how to act to, one is how an actor see itself. Second is how other or outsider to see actor. Thus it is imperative that it is the must to raise ASEAN awareness among ASEAN member states, especially young people and the people in the rural area, and also to raise awareness of ASEAN at the international stage as well. Of course, many AMS ASEAN member states have significantly achieved much objective, but more need to be done so that people from all walks of life can feel the ownership of ASEAN, and therefore ASEAN identity is presented with acceptance from all levels. ASEAN consists of rich and diverse cultures presented in many, uh, many cases, even in our um, video clips just uh, shown earlier, um, which are significant identities of each nation. There is, therefore, it is important to widely raise awareness of national identity and ASEAN identity, which can be coexist side by side and can be presented to the world. And I think this is very important and, and it is raised by many others that you know, each ind individual country has its own culture and need to be presented. And those people in each individual ASEAN country need to understand that presenting or um, uh, having ASEAN identity is also to promote their own. I think that that is very important that we need to encourage, and I, I saw some uh, literature also presented that, that, that point. How are, we, how are we to develop ASEAN identity? Or how are we to bring ASEAN brand to ASEAN people and to the world? My point here is that, you know, uh, how can we accept it as identity when we do not know ourselves? And that is, that is what, uh, one of the points that I would like to raise personally. So um, 
how, how my, one of my questions here, uh, how can we bring an ASEAN brand as a, a pathway uh, to uh, ASEAN people and to the world? The brand that is accepted and proud by all the peoples from ordinary to the government officials, not only uh, the government official knowing ASEAN, and I, I know I, if, if I, because I conduct field research like professor, you know, talking to the people at the, at the countryside, you know, like they might not care or they might not know, like Jonathan asked, the, the, put on the, the screen asking the question, how do you, uh, you know, do, how do you feel about the being ASEAN or something like that? I think uh, to the, to the that I am speaking from the experience of people in Cambodia, they might not feel. So this is, I think this is uh, significantly um, crucial to make people aware of ASEAN before introducing the ideas of that. So how can, how can we do that? Branding ASEAN is a long term, and I, that is what I, what I think and I feel, and a key portal and pathway to develop an identity. This is a collective effort. It's not only one Cambodia or one Malaysia or Indonesia. It's collective effort among all the stakeholders. For instance, what can be done, for instance? I, I see some um, 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 uh, bringing, uh, for example, bringing ASEAN, ASEAN music to ASEAN people and to the world. How can we do that? I see there are examples that ASEAN musicians come together and compose something. And that is, you know, like uh, bringing them as the ownership, you know, like there are, there are some combination taste of Cambodia, taste of Philippines, taste of Indonesia we can combine. That is also a, a, a sort of creative uh, things that we can introduce by respecting the traditions, the, the local, and then highlighting the, new, the creativity. I think that is one, one way of, um, uh, of, uh, that we can do to promote cultural and creative sectors it can be also developed. And I think this is very important as well. Cambodian is uh, uh, trying to initiate uh, at least developing uh, uh, as, as some sort of uh, uh, cultural centers that, cultural and creative centers that can help uh, uh, people from all, you know, like ASEAN counter, counter, counterpart or ASEAN uh, artists to take part and to share their knowledge, to bring, to come together, to talk as a hub so that they can have idea and create something and brand it as ASEAN. And then people will see, will, will feel it, that is ASEAN. And, and I think that is one of the pathways that we can uh, go through that. The other one is the uh, ASEAN game. You know, like, uh, I, I, I like to see, for example, because I, my department, um, there was a question about what is your department general is about, it's techniques. Uh, my, my department general names, it is a, the literal translation from Cambodian. W uh, one of the, the tasks for us is to safeguarding intangible cultural heritage and promoting uh, cultural and creative industries. That is what, that is what uh, our main work, but you know, like, uh, there, there is a long history I don't need to explain here. But what is important here, I think ASEAN game, it is very important, selected from other uh, people. For, for, ex for example, I see an example of field hockey. Field hockey is, you can see in, in Europe, con in European countries, but field hockey, they exist in Cambodia. Traditionally, uh, since the 10th century or, or uh, 12th century that we, we see the bar reliefs, you know, we see example, 10th century existence of the field hockey in Cambodia. In, in Laos, I, I know, but I don't know in many other countries, but we can develop that kind of uh, traditional games and brand it as ASEAN game and we support it and highlight it at the world stage and inviting the, the Western to come and uh, not arguing with the Western way of life but you know like taste ASEAN, taste the, the local traditions. This is what I, I think because uh, sometimes we can do something that we can take pride in um, the UNESCO way is multinational nomination you know, of the intangible cultural heritage. We can take part in that. We, 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 we conduct one of the, uh, the tagging rituals and game we call, it is a multinational nomination conducted by Korean, uh, Korea, Philippines, Vietnam, and Cambodia. The four countries, and I think there are many others. So if we can develop that, and, and the local people will sense of ownership, you know, this is very similar. This is our, Cam our ASEAN. I think that is the, the, that is the pathway. I'd like to end my, my, my um, presentation here, and I think our uh, great 
uh, esteemed panelists will bring up more uh, the uh, the substantial point for to enrich our discussions and then I thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suyon, for leading us off in a discussion by asking some very relevant and foundational questions on how we see ourselves and how we see others. And I think as our uh, participants in this room and also in the virtual space, uh, those will be interesting questions for us to contemplate and we'll be interested to hear your views. And also to our friends from ROK as well, how do you see us as a good friend of ASEAN? Uh, well, you're not too far away, you are also part of us, but how, how you see us also will be interesting for us to contemplate our future path ahead. And also thank you, Mrs. Dion, for giving some practical insights and suggestions on the way to move forward. Um, may I move on to the next speaker uh, to invite Professor Davy uh, to continue our discussion. Ibu, please. Good. Uh, actually, I took part in the, in the discussion when we formed the narrative of ASEAN identity. Uh, se several uh, series of discussions carried out by, uh, uh, driven by the Indonesian Ministry of Culture. And as you can imagine, when scholars get together talking about identity, we didn't come to any particular conclusion. All we decided at the time is that, you know, we all have multiple identities. As individuals, we identify with our family, with our ethnic groups, we have religious groups, we have schools, and so on. We all have multiple identities. And we have primordial identities, and then we have constructed identities. And for all of the ASEAN countries, national identities itself is still very much a work in progress. It is still very contested. In Indonesia, we still have problems in Papua, we have just only recently settled the situation in Aceh. In the Philippines, the issue in southern Mindanao is still a problem. You know, there's still no sense of belonging to the nation state of the Philippines. In Thailand, uh, the same, the same uh, problem. So, so a, a lot of identities that we want to develop have to be constructed and it's ongoing at the same time. And then we are now moving into regional identity. And I've studied ASEAN for a long time. And this, of course, is a tough sell. Because for, the mo for most of ASEAN's life, we did not want to foster an ASEAN identity. Because during the first two decades of ASEAN, it was very much national identity, and ASEAN was created as uh, you know, a minimalist regional association, which would allow each individual nation state to focus inward. It's only in the past 20 years that we began to talk about a regional identity and constructing. And Mark, you know, we have Mark. When did we come up with the narrative? It only came up in 2020. Therefore, even though ASEAN is 55 years, it's only been in the past two years that we are talking about the need to develop a regional ASEAN identity. So I think that so uh, this means that, you know, we, are, we have been very cautious about this. ASEAN usual making hay slowly and we are quite slow. You know, we were already 55 years old before we decided that we need to have a narrative of ASEAN identity. And then when we come up with this, with this um, uh, you know, how do we define identities? It's the inherited identities that come from our primordial uh, identities, uh, as well as, you know, our national identities, which is not primordial. You know, it's very much constructed. And then we want to develop an, an ASEAN identity. And what is an uh, ASEAN identity? And we talk about imagined community. That came very much from Ben Anderson. You know, what is the nation state is an imagined community. Because I come from West Sumatra. The similarities of culture between people in Sumatra are much greater with Malay Peninsula than with Java. But as an imagined community, from Sabang to Morocco, we are Indonesian. And, and, and that is a struggle because a lot of people in the eastern part of Indonesia are Melanesians and, and some of them do not want to belong to the imagined community of Indonesia. They want to belong to imagine to something else. So this is an imagined community. So an ASEAN identity is not simply a composite of identities of various nation states and on top of each other. So it's not just about agricultural societies or eating rice and have similarities and, and so on, which is very important. 
they should be seen as building blocks rather than stumbling blocks when, uh, for this imagined community. But clearly, more, you know, much more hard work needs to be done to achieve this constructed, imagined community, this sense of regional identity. So it's not just talking about dancing or sports. Every time Indonesia and Malaysia uh, fight football, there's no sense of ASEAN identity there, I can tell you. <laughs> so sports can also divide, not, not simply unite, because that spirit of competitiveness, especially between cousins, uh, is much greater. You know, it's less toxic if Indonesia plays against Vietnam. But if Indonesia plays against Malaysia, the two sides do not want to lose. So, 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 so be very mindful also. You know. So when we talk about similarities, it's good as building blocks. But if you look at the Middle East, they're all the same ethnic groups. They're all the same language group. They're all the same religion. They do not have an imagined community of one regional identity. They fight each other all the time because tribalism is very important. So I think this is, we need to be very mindful of this. So I just, uh, because I only have 10 minutes, um, I probably, uh, there's no uh, time there, so I don't really know how much time I've got left. So how do we, you know, I just like to answer these questions very quickly, just some keywords. How do we foster and develop a shared regional identity? The key words would be two, structural and cultural. Structural means we decide on it at the top level. It's the political decisions through various agreements that we make at the ASEAN level. We have declarations, we have treaty, we decide on cooperation, we carry out in a very deliberate manner. You know, that is a structural. In the same way that we build a nation state, we have constitutions, we have laws, we have institutions, uh, we have ways of doing things, and we have uh, real concrete uh, activities you know, to develop peace and security, to develop uh, prosperity, to develop uh, 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 you know, uh, an advanced society, and, and so on. So that is, the, uh, I would uh, term that as structural, as uh, you know, it's this policy-driven uh, 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 way of uh, achieving uh, that imagined, constructed imagined community. And then cultural. Cultural means through education, through dissemination of information, and, uh, and there are people here who are more experts on this than me, but education is very, very important. We sang the ASEAN anthem here. I not a single sign from the audience, because I bet very few of us actually knows what the ASEAN anthem is. So when we're talking about identity, when we're talking about national identity, we sing the national anthem at school every, every Monday. You know, we have to sing that. Every time we have uh, uh, meetings, we have that. Do we have that in ASEAN? Clearly, you know, education, not just at the tertiary level, but from you know, uh, the uh, primary school, secondary school, university, we need to teach about ASEAN, not just about facts and figures, not just about what countries are ASEAN, but also we learn about the song, but we also learn about what ASEAN stands for. So the values and, and, and so on. You know. And then how do we communicate? You know, the, now, of course, you know, we have many ways of communicating, televisions, social media, uh, uh, the uh, conventional media and, and so on. So uh, there are many ways. That is the means, yeah, the tools. But what are you going to convey? So you don't just focus on the tools. What exactly are you going to convey? And this is what does the um, imagined community stand for? And this comes, you know, to what are coming to the second question. What are the necessary conditions? And here the narrative talks about uh, three um, uh, markers, yeah? Awareness, relevance, and appreciations. Awareness, you have knowledge about it. It is necessary, but not sufficient. We, in Indonesia, we say, tidak tahu, maka tidak kenal. Tidak kenal, maka tidak sayang. If you don't have any information about it, if you don't know it, you do not have understanding of it. Kenal means no, you know, no in deeper sense. And then you won't, if you don't know it, you won't love it. So it is true, awareness is not the same as having uh, you know, a sense of identity, but without awareness, an identity is mindless. We're not sure what the identity is for. So I think so, uh, that, that is very important. So having this develop relevance through, it, touch, it has to touch our daily life. So ASEAN has to be much more down to earth. Yeah? And appreciation both from our people and also from people from outside. That what ASEAN stands, what ASEAN achieves, that will uh, give appreciation. And how achievable is it to transcend and translate ASEAN as an institutional identity into one that resonates with the people, you know. We have given, Simon and I, we have given ASEAN tough love all the time. For a long time, ASEAN is minimalist, elitist, 
bureaucratic. And it's only since you know, we decided to develop a community that even other departments besides the foreign ministry got involved in ASEAN. And now we have to engage the people because when you're talking about community, it means people. And we talk about people-centered, people-oriented, but it's easier said than done because it, talk, because it means actually participation, not mobilization. Real participation means democracy, not just being mobilized to do things because of directives from the top, but it means in actually owning the various activities. It means taking part in the decision-making process, deciding, participating in what are good and what are important for them. And that means, you know, that is much more than, than uh, you know, an autocratic, authoritarian, uh, top-down approach. And, and this is a challenge because, frankly, ASEAN itself is not terribly democratic. In our societies, within ASEAN, democracy is in a de deficit. Even within nation states, which are supposed to be democratic, decision makings are often not terribly, terribly participative. You know, are, that's why in Indonesia there are a lot of demonstrations, for example, uh, of a lot of decisions being made. So this is a, a real challenge. So is it possible to do it? Yes, but you have to have a real commitment to do this. It has to be a whole of government, a whole of people approach. Uh, uh, and uh, it has to use multiple channels and uh, modalities. But sincerity is the most uh, important thing here. And how do we achieve resilience? I think that we have to stress again, you know, these connections between national resilience and regional resilience. As you said, you know, the regional entity should not be seen to undermine national uh, entity, but national policy should not beggar uh, uh, the regional interests either. So we have to be able to synergize the national and the regional interests at all uh, times. And, 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 and this takes a lot of commitment, including funding your own activities. And ASEAN states means, you know, while we appreciate support from dialogue partners, like for this, from the uh, ROK and so on, that means more commitment. Put your money where your mouth is also for ASEAN states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu. Um, as evoking and provocative and as tough love as usual. Thank you very much, Ibu. Uh, so thank you very much for reminding us on the multiple identities that we each hold, our societies, our na nations hold, and also these uh, multiple identities can sometimes be contending as well. So it's not an easy task that uh, lay ahead of us. Uh, may I uh, move on to our next speaker? Uh, may I invite Dr. Hu Chu Ping uh, for her presentation, please. Chu Ping. Much. Uh, to the organizers, uh, funders, uh, ASEAN Secretariat, ASEAN Korea uh, Cooperation Fund, and of course uh, the ROK mission to ASEAN. So um, with this panel uh, being designed in the way that uh, we need to face what are the realities of um, the nature of our regional identity, and since this is an attempt by our dialogue partner, South Korea, to try to understand what ASEAN really wants and what else can uh, South Korea do to enhance uh, our cohesion. Because if our partners couldn't understand us, there, uh, then cooperation would be difficult to be forged. So I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to have these uh, conversations and dialogue. So even though ASEAN as a talk shop was often uh, being <laughs> seen as a, a weakness. But I actually think that this is uh, our strength. So, um, but I also hope that whatever we talk about today in this uh, hall, uh, Nusantara room, <laughs> um, can also be shared uh, in the wider audience. As uh, Professor Dewi has rightfully mentioned, uh, ASEAN has been elitist for too long. So um, if the people in this room doesn't know about ASEAN Anthem, so what else about the ASEAN citizens who are studying in their respective schools and so on. So I would like to bring, uh, highlight three major problems of ASEAN identity and three hows of uh, how we can overcome or uh, achieve that. So firstly, um, actually I find it very difficult because um, Professor Dewi has <laughs> mentioned many points and I try not to overlap them. So, um, firstly, is the awareness of um, ASEAN-ness. <laughs> so, um, I really appreciate Mr. Jonathan Tan for uh, having that survey before this panel because you can really um, uh, prompt 
um, everyone here in this room to think about, even though they are not the citizens of ASEAN, whether uh, this should be considered as um, uh, our region. So we often having dialogues with our dialogue partners, the United States, South Korea, Japan, Australia. So one thing that um, uh, we notice is that Mekong, Southeast Asia, and also Maritime, Southeast Asia, are often being treated as two different sets of uh, country. So that actually highlights the divide. And even among the maritime nations, Brunei, Philippines, seems to be um, quite far away from <laughs> uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. So uh, in that way, can we foster a kind of um, understanding towards each other the Mekong countries understanding the problems of uh, Maritimes and the Maritime Southeast Asia understanding the need to support our um, neighbours in the Mekong region. So obviously, why the need to uh, foster um, uh, a stronger sense of uh, ASEAN-ness is because we know that the major powers uh, uh, can create divisive uh, impact on um, our uh, regional uh, identity. So in terms of... Uh, how we can um, overcome this, uh, we need to talk about um, a very difficult questions, uh, problems such as human rights. So this is why when Myanmar crisis emerged, we have problems trying to resolve this. And when the five-point consensus, for now it was considered as a um, as failure, um, and we cannot, uh, as per our ASEAN Charter, to protect the people, the innocent people in Myanmar. So. So should we try to review our ASEAN principles? So what do we mean when we trying to ensure that all ASEAN member states are one? So where is our oneness? So um, the next is uh, about the imagined uh, community. <laughs> so I also think that Southeast Asians tend to think that um, we tend to imagine everything is okay. <laughs> so um, uh, we are quite laid back and we are happy-go-lucky and this is something that I think most of our major partners <laughs> finding uh, hard to understand. But um, uh, I think the way we platform ASEAN Centre, ASEAN Oneness, and this is where the actions can be carried out. If we really uh, uh, invest uh, in ourselves. The second how uh, on the awareness is to um, really highlight um, um, how the bridges can be built. So in terms of hard infrastructures, uh, we have physical connectivity. Every ASEAN country have their economic development plan. East-West Economic Corridor, North-South Economic Corridor, Kunming Singapore Railway, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So um, all those things also requiring uh, investments and also commitment. But on the soft infrastructure, digital connectivity, technological um, um, sharing and all that. So how are we going to bridge uh, the gaps? And these gaps doesn't only exist in material form. It is in the idea, different age group. So do the young people feel the same way as the um, senior uh, professionals? So, um, socio-economically, we all know that the pandemic has already widened the socio-economic gap in all countries around the world. So, shouldn't ASEAN also uh, need to invest in our ASEAN public health infrastructure? As we know that uh, the global disease uh, would return uh, in the shortened um, time uh, intervals. So, my um, uh, next how would be about uh, materialized plan, action base. The fact is that we already have so many existing networks, niches of cooperation. So, for example, in the area <laughs> of um, difficult um, uh, problems like South China Sea dispute in Mekong, we have the committee, we have the uh, code of conduct process. So, instead of criticizing how they can be uh, uh, unhelpful, why not we come together and talk about how to make them helpful in uh, solidifying our um, security economically, politically, and also sociocultural. So not only among ASEAN, we need to have a kind of a make good use of ASEAN University Network in education, but also um, ASEAN political security. The blueprint is the thinnest <laughs> document out of all the uh, community blueprint. So we should be um, brave to own up to our um, differences 
ASEAN ISIS network, CISCAP network that we have among ourselves and with our dialogue partners should be utilized um, um, as best as possible so that uh, we can further strengthen um, the existing uh, cultural, economic and also political network that we enjoy so much. Um, I'm not trying to deny the progress that ASEAN has already been made. In fact, ASEAN as an institution is the unifying force in this region, now known as the Indo-Pacific. So most of the major powers in the world uh, have partnership with ASEAN. So as a platform, we are highly successful. Regional institutions as such um, that, that focus not only in Southeast Asia region, but to its wider region, to the entire of East Asia, Asia Pacific, and now the Indo-Pacific. So unlike European Union that really only focus on their <laughs> region uh, in the other corner of the world, I think ASEAN is a very unique uh, regional institution and we should not uh, forsake the progress that has been made so far. So uh, some of the um, um, uh, things that uh, we have done, uh, we should not forget about them. And um, learning from the Korean experience, so the inter-Korean <laughs> Um, exchanges has been marked with so many problems, so many challenges, but yet whenever there are opportunities present, they make progress. For example, in environmental conservation uh, as, uh, and also in uh, cultural languages, they actually created inter-Korean dictionary to understand the different vocabulary between North and South Korea. So for ASEAN, perhaps, even though we have way too many languages to grab with, but perhaps uh, we should have uh, similar um, um, uh, initiatives and also uh, in a way uh, to also showcase our cultural uh, heritage, tangible, intangible ones, not only among the ASEAN citizens, but also to our partners from around the world. Um, for that, I look forward to the next part of the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hu, for the very uh, interesting and insightful presentation. Uh, so for highlighting intergenerational paradigms, uh, many ways and means to uh, foster awareness, identity, and also to remind us that uh, we do have a lot of advantages at our disposal. We do not have to start from ground zero. Uh, we have existing mechanisms. It's how to make use of these mechanisms to be more effective. Um, Next, last but not least, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Megay uh, 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 to uh, give our last presentation and to uh, lead us uh, to a conclusion for this discussion before we open up for Q&A. Professor? Thank you very much. And I would like to rejoice about this possibility of constructing an ASEAN identity. But I want to focus a little more on its feasibility. Uh, it is good that ASEAN has inserted itself as a player in geopolitics. But now we are in a stage where we're trying to deepen our community. And I think it's important to think, how feasible is this? Uh, when we're thinking about this grand uh, idea of an identity, because we have a great deal of diversity in language, culture, even our responses to the experience of colonialism. And also, uh, we need to think through how do we together construct our so-called inherited and uh, acquired values from the global community. Now, perhaps the challenge can be summarized in this way. How do we turn the global fact of economic integration, concerns over political security, and mere accidents of contiguity into a conscious solidarity and a sense of community that transcends loyalty to mere ethnicities and our narrow interests as nation states? Now, this is a big question that requires some clarity on the nature of the social cultural realities that we face today before we can even begin to make an answer. I would like to think a little bit about 
the reality of technology and the so-called cultural homogenization. Now we live in a technologically mediated social environment. The market has trumped the sovereignty of nation states and also the global connectivity, according to some analysts, is leveling cultures. Now, part of the optimism over an ASEAN imagined community is based on the so-called virtual communities that are now being put together by the internet. Technology is shaping many cultures and it is no longer just a tool but it alters our mental habits. As an analyst once said, computers don't just do things for us. They do things to us, including our ways of thinking about ourselves and other people. Computer screens are no longer just uh, things that we use, but they are new locations for our fantasies, whether erotic or intellectual. Now, it is true that on the surface, there seems to be a cultural homogenization that is going on. We see this in the global youth culture. And we also see it in this grow, growing global middle class whose consumption patterns are more or less similar. But cultures, I think it is important to underscore, even when they are entangled forcibly as in the age of colonization and empires, or whether they are looped into the orbit of global currents, they also choose what they will do with these newfound tools, appropriating them within their value system. They do not function in the same way as in the original form. source. For instance, Filipinos do not really use cell phones primarily for information. We use it for social connection. In other words, identity formation requires changes in what anthropologists call the deep structures. It's important to recognize that there is this as iceberg theory of culture. You have the deep structures below which actually shape the phenomena that we see in terms of systems, structures, material culture. The deep structures would be the environment, the way it is shaping us. The maritime cultures are very different, no? From land-based cultures, we have religion, cosmology, and our worldviews, which have shaped us. Now, it is very easy when we are talking about uh, surface structures, which are actually material culture and so on. Now, these are easy to change. I am a student of culture change, so I pay a great deal of attention on this. Um, the the surface structures very easily change, no? Dietary shifts, uh, we now have rice, sushi, and pizza, and so on, and we have all kinds of innovations in modern transport. But the deep structures, when you scratch more deeply, present themselves, you know, just beneath the surface, our souls wedded to familiar spirits, held in thrall by caste or duty to clan, to family, feng shui, and other such elaborate cords and rituals for seeking help from nature, protection from evil, and in general, securing the blessings of our ancestors for health and happiness. In other words, these are, sorry, these are deep structures that very rarely change through time, if ever. Note, for instance, in this day and age, the persistence of caste, of patriarchal hierarchies, of social inequalities. There is a certain plasticity about human nature, as you know, relativists would say, but also a very certain, a certain permanent integrity about racial genetics, the soil and the climate in which our bodies and souls 
are rooted, as essentialists would say. Now, the failure to engage the deep structures of Asian cultures also partly accounts for the continuing resistance of our religious traditions when it comes into tension with modernity. So, for instance, we have the resurgence of political religions, whether they are fundamentalist Islam or the religious right in the U.S. We need to recognize, as a missiologist, Stephen Neal once said, there has never yet been a great religion which did not find its expression in a great culture. And there has never yet been a great culture which did not have deep roots in a religion. We live in a continent whose religions rival Christianity in comprehensiveness and philosophical depth. We need to identify the commonalities in our religions that can serve as a baseline for constructing an ASEAN identity and also identify those differences that need to be negotiated with tolerance and respect. Now, le let me talk a little bit about um, the so-called ASEAN way and what it means to construct an ASEAN identity. Um, I think my PowerPoint is uh, getting ahead of me. Anyway. Now, it's, uh, let me go back to um, why is this? Uh, I'm sorry. Now, let me think about the so called constructed and inherited values. Now, the ASEAN way has been mostly based on our common inherited values, always at play in negotiating country-specific interests, respect for hierarchy, emphasis on harmonizing differences behind the scenes rather than open conflict, and considerable weight put on the collective interest rather than individual rights and identity. Now, these values, however, have a shadow side. Respect for authority becomes authoritarianism. The preference for back-channel negotiations may lack straightforward transparency. And so-called constructive engagement has been without teeth when we're dealing with human rights abuses and undemocratic regimes. Jupi has talked about the fact that we may need to revisit huh? the way we deal with these issues. Now, the founders of ASEAN were right in staying clear of the war of the elephants during the Cold War and appropriating modern post-Westphalian ideals like the sovereignty of nation states, which were lessons learned from the bloody wars of independence in Europe and its own anti-colonial struggles. But this has now transformed itself. It has morphed into unqualified non-interference. Even when member regimes violate the so-called democratic and rules-based order that ASEAN has embraced. In constructing an ASEAN identity, we need to identify which inherited values are to be in runs and which can be brought into the future and which values emerging from globalization need to be transformed for usability in our own contexts. Dysfunctions in democratic governance, for instance, arise because of the lack of a civic culture to support it. As a Guatemalan sociologist has put it, 
we have the hardware of democracy. All the newly restored democracies in the 80s, 90s, no? But the software of authoritarianism. And I think this is true with many of our cultures. It is true that democracy that is, has developed in the West has been unduly universalized. I think there is no one-size-fits-all way of doing democracy. The challenge before us is building institutions based on our cultural context and not on borrowed ideologies. There is need for a consensus on the paradigm shifts that need to happen if we are to grow into what has been called a sense of the commons. Our mental models, sorry, we may need to recover our ancient practice of the commons. Trafficking across porous borders that enable trade, people movements, settlements, as against post-Westphalian territoriality that was introduced by colonial powers. Migration and cross-cultural exchange had been happening in this region since 30,000 years ago, as studies have said. For instance, the South China Sea, historically, has been common waters for all the littoral states around it. So I think it's important to recover that heritage. Also, the world has been continually involving towards a code of civilizational civility as encrypted in international law. This should be brought to bear in shaping a common culture and identity, one that is based not on merely real politics, considerations like economic interest, military might, but a social ethic that respects a rest, that respects a rules and rights-based order. One of the things that uh, we really need to embrace together is this social ethic. Now, how do we map the way forward? Translating the ASEAN as an institution into a social identity requires cultural literacy that fosters a fellow feeling that bounds people into a community. This is done not through government edicts, you know, all these bureaucracies that we produce, but through people-to-people -people encounters that erases preconceptions and stereotypes about one another. I think it's important to grasp that even with globalization, now that we are face to face, while the physical barriers to communication are rapidly disappearing, according to Daniel Katz, who's a social psychologist, he says that the psychological obstacles remain. We do not go at constructing a shared identity by papering over differences. We like to be polite to one another, as Jupiter said. But we must engage each other most personally with our most authentic selves and our most deeply held beliefs. Real dialogue happens when we talk to each other as we are. As the psychologist Henry Nouwen puts it, what is most personal is also most universal. And Clifford Gertz, an anthropologist, says that it may be in our oddities, in our particularities, in our idiosyncrasies as cultures and peoples, that what is most generically human is revealed. It is as we encounter the peculiarities of our identities that we discover together the depths of our common humanity. Our longing for peace, for prosperity, for justice for all. This is a human and a common longing shared by all. And I hope that in constructing an ASEAN identity, this forms as the baseline 
of our principles together. Thank you. Masalamat po. Thank you very much, Professor Megay, for uh, reminding us that uh, identities do not occur or develop or progress in a vacuum. It's in, embedded in cultural, political context, and also historical as well. And in that context, that ASEAN being a relatively new institution, uh, we're 55 years this year, but I would think that we are younger because uh, 1967 we were five, but uh, from 1999 we were 10 in that sense. So our new identity should incorporate our newer members from 1999 onwards. Yeah. Um, so in, 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 in that sense, uh, we thank all the presenters for giving us a very diverse view on what identity is, and also I'm struck by uh, the perspective that you have taken from a cultural perspective, from a political perspective, from a cultural perspective, reminding us that identities is not one-dimensional. It's not one pillar, although this initiative is headed by the AACC, but it has to be owned, it has been driven, it has to be supported by an all-community uh, uh, effort in that sense. It is owned by all of us not just by elites, as uh, Professor, Me Professor Devi and also uh, Dr. Hu has reminded us, it's not an elitist project. For ASEAN to succeed, it has to be a, a people's project in that sense. How do we move from being elites driven yeah, uh, by the officialdom uh, to being people-centered, people-oriented in that sense. And also, uh, although we did not explicitly use this term, but I think it came through on all the presentations that there is a prevailing concept on unity in diversity. In our forging ISIS identity, we are not uh, subscribing to replacing any identities, but we are thinking of how to work through new identities, how to be think through what is this identity that we are, we are trying to, to build. And as Jonathan has rightly and aptly reminded us this morning that it is an ongoing process that we are still talking through what ASEAN is, what we stand for, what we are, where we want to go. Uh, to use a cliche, uh, ASEAN is a work in progress. And similarly, the identity is likewise. Uh, on that note, may I invite uh, colleagues, excellencies to join us in our conversation. Uh, by perhaps posing some questions to our speakers for clarification or perhaps you want to give your perspective. Uh, and I would like to uh, perhaps uh, respectfully ask your interventions to be kept short, maybe two, three minutes, in order to have a broader range and more uh, inclusive discussion uh, from our uh, participants in the room and also participants online as well, as I know that this is being broadcast uh, uh, outside of the Nusantara Hall and we have participants joining us online. Um, may I have a show indication of hands from any colleagues in the room who would like to start off our question and answer session? If not, uh, then uh, we have a question from um, a friend from uh, quite far away, a, a very a close neighbour of ours uh, in Australia, uh, Luis uh, Cabrera from the School of Government of Inter and International Relations at Griffiths University in Australia. Um, the question, if I read out for our presenters and also for our participants, uh, uh, quote, uh, thank you for an extremely instructive panel discussion. I wonder if panellists could share further thoughts on the importance to ASEAN itself of developing an ASEAN regional identity and citizenship. Also, do you envision movement toward a formal regional citizenship agreement similar to the formalization of citizenship in organizations as Mercosur and uh, ECOWAS? I think uh, there are maybe two, two big chunks that we have to unpack here. One is identity itself, which is an ongoing process, and the other notion is the citizenship which is, I think, is an easier question to address in that sense. Um, would the panelists, um, anyone would like to have a first uh, a dip on this question? I see Ibu Devi very enthusiastic, ready to go. Ibu, can I invite you to start off? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think the second one we can say not at the moment, uh, because I think it's very clear that ASEAN, unlike the EU, 
uh, it's not a supranational organization. Uh, ASEAN has, from the very beginnings, very much, and you know, uh, it's gone beyond minimalist. But but uh, the ASEAN Secretariat, for example, is you know, it's not this um, central body that has the power uh, uh, over over the the, the national government. Eventually, maybe I don't know. You know, because when when ASEAN started, uh, the, the, even the concept of integration itself was uh, anathema. The word integration was a dirty word in the beginning. Uh, but but because the world changed, uh, we needed you know the uh, ASEAN to develop uh, closer economically, uh, to remain competitive, to attract investment, uh, and then also uh, in order to make ourselves uh, have greater leverage when we deal with bigger powers that we decided you know, we have integration, and then we decided that we have a need a constitution. So I can't say no, you know, because I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but uh, even EU does not have an EU citizen, uh, citizenship. Citizenship remains at your Westphalian states, uh, uh, the nation states, but uh, clearly there'll be greater privileging uh, for our regional entity in, in the same way that the EU gives privileges to its citizens to a certain extent. Uh, we, to a certain extent, we have already done that, Free border movement and so on, and recognition of passport. I don't know. Maybe in our passport we could have uh, a flag, Joe. Uh, so Filipino flag, see uh, a Filipino uh, passport. But then you also have an ASEAN, you know, uh, flag there, uh, and, and greater recognitions in, in all activities. Uh, but do we need to have an ASEAN identity? Uh, I think the consensus or, uh, is yes. You know, that is uh, a policy driven. We have decided that we want to have an ASEAN identity. Uh, so, um, why do we need to have it? Because a community needs to have, you know, to have this sense of togetherness, of we feeling. And while economic activities, integration, functional integration is necessary, it's not sufficient. You can go to the same supermarket every day. You meet the same people, you buy, you know, this e economic transaction. But you do not develop a sense of community with your, you know, uh, cashiers or with the people in the supermarket. You may go to the same cafe every day. You do not feel that same. But you belong to a particular group, a club, and you develop a sense of Togetherness, why? It's not just what you do, but what you believe in. So there is this vision of common aspiration and, and of a common identity is what marks you. And here, you know, I, I do believe that if when ASEAN wants to have relevance to its people, wants to have sustainability and wants to move forward together, we need to have something that binds us. And there, you know, values become very, very important. And in uh, the narrative, it clearly states that, you know, the values are those enshrined in the ASEAN Charter, Article 2. So some of the uh, traditional values there, of uh, dialogue, harmony, tolerance, uh, consultations, and so on. Also, non-interference in each other's affairs. Uh, but at the same time, new universal values of democracy, human rights, rule of law, and, and so on. And we want to develop this because we want ASEAN to be elevated into a higher level. It's so that it will get more value added, more meaning to our people, but also makes greater recognition, you know, this ASEAN centrality, appreciation of others, and the ability to ensure our strategic autonomy and strategic agency as well. And so, you know, uh, do we need it? Yes. But it, it, it is very much a long-term project. Professor. <clears throat> I am very much with the Professor Dawi when she was talking about ASEAN becoming simply a minimalist structurally. Or, because it's true, I mean, the experience of the European community tells us that you, a supranational organization, is eventually does not become very relevant to specific country interests. At the same time, I think the cultural side of this is that uh, we, we need to foster more relational ties. By this I mean that, um, you know, anthropologists say that it's always easy to do business with a friend. 
In other words, if you're a friend, everything is easy. If you're seen as a hostile enemy, everything is hard. You cannot come to any kind of consensus. So the, the need to develop a social trust. And in many of our countries, the social trust is very low. We don't really trust our politicians. We don't trust our governance. We don't, so there is no, no commonality with the powers that are over us. So I think it's important to recognize the centrality of relationships and how that can be fostered within ASEAN. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question from Professor uh, from Li Yong Yong and also from Excellency. Can I have a show of hands because I think we need to take a last round of questions before we conclude this session. We can take multiple questions at, at the same go. Uh, we have one, two questions. Any other questions on the floor? Three. Okay. Can we start with Excellency and then uh, Yong Yong and then our colleague at the back of the room, please? Can we have the mic for His Excellency in the front, please? Thank you, Excellency. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tang, and thank you for all the panelists for the in-depth analysis and excellent recommendations uh, on the, uh, the way forwards in fostering, nurturing uh, the ASEAN identity. I agree to uh, most of the views and suggestions uh, throughout uh, the panel discussions. And to me, the specific questions, uh, particularly raised by uh, Professor Dewi and the Dr. Hu Chiping about resource contributions from the external partners, including my country. Actually, today's event is supported by the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund, and we have uh, a few folks, Korean, Indonesian, who are working in this building, Secretariat building, uh, to uh, make uh, this fund uh, into reality or into specific uh, projects. So today's uh, uh, symposium was uh, supported uh, by this fund. And uh, I'd like to ask my colleagues working for this fund to continue to uh, pay their attention to this kind of a symposium conference seminar uh, focusing on soul searching uh, for the future of ASEAN. And in other areas of uh, peace, uh, political domain, social, cultural, economic areas, my government is uh, committed, very strongly committed to making uh, useful practical contributions for our bilateral relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. On behalf of the Secretary General and also the people of ASEAN, we thank you and the Government of the Republic of Korea for your continuing uh, support and for being a very good friend and a long-standing partner of our ASEAN community building process. Uh, may I invite my colleague, Yong Yong, for the next question, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Suman. Uh, Panelists, thank you for your sharing your thoughts. For those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Lee Yong Yong uh, from the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, together with Jonathan Said, our work as Community Affairs, we work closely to, to bring, try to bring ASEAN closer to the people in that sense. So ASEAN identity is one of our, one of our bread and butter issues eh, daily. Just wanted to ask the panelists, uh, something not just limited to what uh, this symposium is about, but also talking about young people. Uh, for any surveys that we've done in the past, with us or with ASEAN Foundation, for example, we always realize that among the CLNV countries, the sense of ASEAN identity and belonging always is very strong, very proud, very bright. You know, the young people there always seem to be... They, they, the sense of ASEAN belonging is there in that sense, ASEAN identity, compared to the ASEAN 6, contrary. But that is not my question. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> my question is, after, you know, after what happened in Myanmar after uh, 1st February last year, uh, a lot of these young people from Myanmar leave very untasty remarks on our social website, which is under us. Uh, both my colleague Romeo and myself, we manage it. So we know. 
the, the sense of belonging or, you know, they no longer feel that proud to be part of ASEAN, these young people. My question to you, panelists, in your respective field, how can we bring back the sense of ASEAN belonging to the Myanmar young people, you know, as what we call the damage control? Bearing in mind as what Ibu Dewi has said, a lot of them cannot distinguish what ASEAN can do, what ASEAN cannot do. They always tend to link up what ASEAN can do with what the European colleagues can do, and likewise they expect ASEAN to do. But this is obviously comparing a, a monkey and a fish, because totally two different animals. So I just wanted to ask the panelists what are your thoughts? How can we bring back that, restore the ASEAN belonging to the Myanmar young people, as, you know, especially? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Yong Yong. We've heard ASEAN being compared to a cow, but today we hear that we're being compared to a um, a fish. Yeah. Uh, can I have a colleague at the back of the room for the last question, please? Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. Can you hold on a minute, please, while we give you a, a better mic? Sorry for the technical glitch. Thank you. This, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Romeo Matthew from Abang None Jakarta Selatan, or the youth representative of the government of the South Jakarta. And I really agree with what Professor Dewi Fortuna has said before regarding that ASEAN has to touch our daily life. And reflecting to the event of G20, uh, our government, the government of Indonesia, is trying to socialize and intensifies the logo of G20. It, it could be seen in every uh, government offices, for example, in the building of uh, government of South Jakarta. And I believe that the same concept could, be also, could also be applied in terms of ASEAN, to improve ASEAN awareness and therefore the identity. So do you think that the idea of intensifying the logos of ASEAN in strategic locations, in public transportations, in AMS or ASEAN member states would, would be the great initial move or strategy in, in amplifying ASEAN awareness, thus identity. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting question uh, in uh, raising uh, the awareness and also the branding in that sense uh, to uh, all facets of uh, ASEAN life. Uh, before I turn back to our panelists, may I take the paragraph to ask one simple question to our panelists. Um, what is your view on the notion of ASEAN as a community? Yeah, we always mention ASEAN, ASEAN as an inter-regional organization, uh, but we are also a community. So what does the concept of community mean to you as we think through our identification of not as nation states, not as one entity as ASEAN, but as a community. Does it have different meanings, different connotations, and what are responsibilities, and so on? So uh, we have maybe three questions. Uh, maybe panelists, please feel free to take all three or any of the three. Uh, and also, I would like you to invite you to perhaps give your maybe short concluding remarks to wrap up the, the panel. And if I may, Professor, maybe we can start in the reverse order with uh, Professor and then Chu Ping and Ibu Devi, and then please. Maybe a uh, maximum of three to four minutes, if we can. Yeah. Actually, we no longer are simply an imagined community. We do have shared values, and that has been shown in the way we have behaved uh, in relation to geopolitical uh, interests and concerns. We do have shared values already. I think what needs to be constructed a little more is our commitment to a rules-based order because many of our countries are, are still in the traditional cultural sort of baggage of things that need to be transformed i think that we need to face the fact that even within our nation states uh, the nation state is actually an artificial imposition from our colonial powers the fact is that, as uh, Professor Dawi has said, I mean, the nation state is still a work in progress. Even in our countries, there are lots of marginal communities. All our indigenous tribes and everything are not really part of this national community. 
So I think it's very important to think about what are the rules-based order. They need to be defined as our common commitment together, even when it spinges on values like we do not like open confrontation. We are always indirect. We're not Americans. We, we like to uh, sort of do things behind the scenes because we don't like to embarrass any member country. But, and that's a value. That's a shared value. And it's a community of values. But I think it's important to also be very, very carefully define what we stand for as a community that is beyond our ethnicities and our national borders. Um, so on the community, um, I very much agree that uh, not only rules-based, but also values like uh, human rights, democracy, uh, it's high time for us to embrace it uh, as a, a regional um, values that uh, not only at the governmental level, but at the societal level also Southeast Asians should be very well versed uh, in these issues. So um, in reverse order, uh, the next question is about Myanmar. So to restore uh, the sense of um, <laughs> um, belonging uh, of ASEANers in Myanmar, I think the utmost, um, 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 the, the most um, uh, pressing uh, matters right now is to uh, promote conflict uh, reconciliation among the different stakeholders inside and also um, those that are closely connected to Myanmar. So within Myanmar right now, not only the current uh, ruling uh, government, but also the people or the so-called civilian uh, disobedient movement, um, they are now highly distrust of ASEAN. So to bridge that uh, um, distrust, I think trust building is uh, definitely in order. And, but also in terms of the damage control of um, uh, how they actually perceive um, ASEAN as actually intervening and also um, not democratic enough, not supportive of the uh, human rights of the people enough. So these are the things that uh, we really need to instigate a kind of um, um, and a critical introspection within ASEAN itself. So at the ASEAN Secretariat, um, we really need to move beyond just talk about <laughs> um, just talk about issues, uh, the five point consensus, really where are the actions and the will uh, to to commit to change so um, and that related to the CLMV ASEAN six um, divide uh, of which I also think that for example, back in two thousand and sixteen, I was part of the research group in um, um, promoted by the Malaysian government to understand CLMV. So that was the first time I visited uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos to conduct a research and to understand what really uh, is their perspective on the issues matters to them and how do they perceive uh, actors like Malaysia and the rest of ASEAN uh, to them. So, um, and that brings me to um, uh, Ambassador's uh, question, way forward for ASEAN Korea. So as of now, there may be no um, presidential committee on New Southern Policy anymore, but I believe that uh, the Director uh, General of the ASEAN Bureau at the uh, South Korea MOFA is doing their um, um, very best to ensure that the policy continuity can be uh, sustained uh, even after the so-called Indo-Pacific tilt. Because after all, uh, it is very important for South Korea and ASEAN to um, uh, support each other. More than 90% of South Korea's um, uh, energy comes from maritime uh, route. So ASEAN as a very critical um, um, maritime focal region should be the, uh, the next focal point for ASEAN and Korea to work together. And not to mention that Korea Europe actually have a maritime mechanism platform, but there is no ASEAN uh, Korea maritime platform, for example, uh, which is very curious and <laughs> uh, to me. So that's all for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I would be very interested uh, to see from the Myanmar, the young people who are pro-hunter would be very upset with ASEAN because ASEAN has been tougher uh, than before, more interfering, you know, uh, and has uh, 
has been willing to cross this sacred cow of no interference because uh, you know we we uh, use the values of democracy and human rights while the young people who are uh, from the democracy uh, groups will be very disappointed with ASEAN because ASEAN has not been vigorous enough has not been strong enough so I think that for the time being until you know the issue in Myanmar uh, is, uh, is resolved satisfactorily I think various spectrums in Myanmar will be very unhappy with ASEAN but the question is are we happy with Myanmar now this comes to I like to answer the, the last question first what do we mean by being a community here yeah? So a committee where we are creating this identity, a distinct identity, not just composite of ASEAN members, but there is a distinct identity, a clear boundary, clear rules and regulations and institutions, values, and what can be done and what cannot be done, the do's and the don'ts. And our constitution is the charter that tells you what the values are. In the original, as you remember, the original of the draft, there was actually a mechanism for sanction. When the, the wise men uh, or the wise women drafted the ASEAN Charter, there were actually language that said, you know, these are the values, the rules and, and, and regulations of ASEAN. And what happened if you vi violate? If you go to school, if you violate school, you get suspension. You know, you get called to the teacher's room, you have to do more homework. Or if you really violate, you get sent home and your parents will be called, right? And in any organization, if you belong to a club and you violate the club, you can be blackballed. Therefore, it also means, you know, not just how, we, uh, how the Myanmar young people can be restored to the bosom of ASEAN sense of belonging. For me, you know, in a lot of ASEAN countries, it, what can Myanmar do to ensure that you deserve to be really a full-fledged full member of ASEAN? Because we do not have the mechanisms of expulsion, but this is, you know, uh, short of that, uh, uh, say, you know, no high representatives. And I'm, I believe in tough love. If you want to have a, a strong community, then you have to have, you know, what does the community stand for? And stand for it consistently. If you do not stand for your own rules, then why should anybody else respect it? If we talk about ASEAN centrality and we expect other countries to ex respect ASEAN centrality, while member states themselves do not respect ASEAN centrality, then I think that ASEAN diminishes its own stature. So what does community stand for? You know, you, we, we can just read the ASEAN Charter and all the things, but what it means that, you know, you decide this is us, what we stand for, and what we can tolerate and what we cannot tolerate. And I think that moving forward, we need to, uh, you know, review the Charter as we promised and, and, and strengthen it. Otherwise, it will continue, uh, you know, uh, not to be uh, valued and respected by their own uh, member states. And, and coming to that, uh, how do we ensure, you know, that ASEAN touch uh, real lives? So the usual way is you know, cooperation. Uh, if you look at the, um, the uh, Youth Development Index and, and all the surveys for the young people, it's clearly what relates to them most, jobs, yeah? economic cooperation, development cooperation, poverty eradication, and, and uh, for those from their um, newer member countries, they have expectations that ASEAN will assist them in getting better lives, uh, as well as you know, ex uh, exchanges, tourism, and, and, and so on. And it's not surprising that despite the fact that the Singapore has the best means of obtaining information, the lowest, the skepticism towards ASEAN is strongest in Singapore, is consistent. And uh, in Thailand, it's the Chulalongkorn University. You know, uh, the, for, for the people from the elite group, uh, they feel less values for ASEAN. Now, this, I think, is a real mistake because what it means is that, you know, they only look at ASEAN from a transactional perspective. They take stability for granted. They take peace, security, and stability for granted because all of them, just focus on what can I get out of ASEAN in terms of economic benefits. But people forget why you created ASEAN. That, you know, without ASEAN, we will be at war with each other. There will not be this ability to continue to prosper together. And this, I think, we have really failed, maybe, to inculcate this understanding uh, towards our young people. And that's why education about ASEAN is not just about what countries are members of ASEAN, what is the logo of ASEAN, you know, what is the national anthem, but 
or exactly the history of what it was like before ASEAN was founded, what it is like in other regions where they may have similar cultures and so on, but they still kill each other uh, you know, through, through conflicts. So intra-ASEAN relations would not be harmonious without ASEAN, you know, and extra-ASEAN relations. We will not have the strategic autonomy, the agency, the respect, you know, the ability to become the convener of all these meetings where all great powers come here. This is not taken into consideration by, by, by the, uh, uh, you know, the people who are surveyed, they are people. And maybe that is the mistakes, the folks or the questions also. Maybe the, you know, for, for the, the, the future survey, the needs to elaborate uh, a bit more so that this is reflected because I'm very upset actually when it says, you know, they put political and co security cooperation very low down. While in fact, you know, the ability to cooperate together economically is because we are stable, we are peaceful, and then and we continue to need to, to develop that. And yes, uh, you know, the ASEAN logo, uh, the ASEAN National Day should be celebrated not only when your country is chair of ASEAN. It should be continuous. Indonesia is uh, chair of G20, so we have a lot of G20, but next year it will not be like that, so people will forget. But while if you're building community, it has to be continuous. So the ASEAN National Day should be celebrated, in not just at the ASEAN Secretariat, but by all schools, by all government offices, uh, and, and so on. So I think that there is, there should be a conscious effort. But I say, you know, uh, we should also make sure that, you know, there is, ASEAN should be tough love, you need to deserve also to be, you know, to be continued to be a respected member of ASEAN. Hey, um, I don't have much to add more because the, the, this um, panelist is the, uh, the place where I learn more than I, I can say or I can share about uh, Cambodia, like the last point that you just made. And I think that is very crucial and very important to raise awareness among the younger people, for example, if Cambodia is the, the chair of ASEAN, we are celebrating designated uh, ASEAN city and just for two, uh, two years or also like that, I, I don't think it will sustain. So it is, I think the secretariat might be encouraged all the stakeholders or the, the ASEAN member states to continuously, for example, the gentleman over there raised about the using of the logos and stuff like that at the local level. I think that is the the, the most important. What, what I would like to say is that we have to make all from all uh, stakeholders, from the local people to the higher ranking officers, is the, the commitment. The commitment to see the, you know, like what are the identities for all that can be accepted by all the societies. And I think this is very important. If not accepted, how can you, you know, like uh, present it as this is my identity. I think that is a very important point that I would like to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our panelists and also to our participants in the room and also virtually. Uh, in the interest of time, I know that we are standing between you and your well-deserved coffee break. I will not attempt to summarize our very rich discussion, I will, but I will invite you to continue the discussion with our panelists during coffee break, during, uh, throughout the whole day to pick their brains and to continue your discussion. And then also thank you for all the good work for our colleagues and also for your support as we uh, work through uh, our process to inculcate and to expand our asset identity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our, uh, uh, our panelists uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, Prof, because we have to, we have to end. Uh, please join me in thanking our, our panelists uh, for the wonderful presentation and insightful uh, uh, remarks. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the speakers of panel discussion one and to Dr. Tang for your expert moderation. So now we will take our uh, awaited break. Uh, for now, uh, we understand that it's already almost 12, but uh, coffee, snacks, tea, water, very big snacks are already served outside. So uh, we hope you can enjoy them. Uh, we have 10 minutes for coffee break and then we will resume with the second plenary discussion. Uh, for 40 minutes and then we will break for lunch. So please enjoy the snacks are uh, there on uh, the left side.
Hello. Uh, may we also kindly remind everyone, please do not bring food inside the hall. Uh, please enjoy them outside as we are not allowed to bring any food and drinks uh, inside the hall. Thank you.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we know that you're still enjoying your break, uh, but we would like to begin the program shortly if uh, we can invite you back into the hall so we can begin a plenary session too.
gentlemen, may we invite you back into the hall so we can uh, proceed with panel discussion too. So we can proceed with panel discussion too. After panel discussion too, we will uh, have a lunch break. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you back into the Nusantara Hall. We apologize for cutting your uh, break. We promise a longer break for lunch. So if we can invite you back in.
at the hall, please uh, join us so we can begin the second uh, panel discussion. Outside, please uh, join us. We promise you an equally interesting panel discussion. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming back into the hall and apologies for a very short break. Uh, later we will have a longer break and we, we hope that you had enough, just, uh, just enough time to have some coffee. Um, so continuing with our program, the panel discussion too will be moderated by Mr. Jonathan Tan. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Erika. So I hope that you have enjoyed your coffee break and I know that this really cuts into the uh, lunch time, you know, lunch time naturally for uh, most of us. Uh, but I hope that the substantive snack that you have, and of course the interesting panel discussions that we're going to have right now, uh, will fill your stomach and your hearts as well. Um, we have two panelists with us, and we also have another panelist who has done a pre-recorded uh, remarks, which we shall play after. We have these two panelists um, presenting uh, their thinking and um, views on this second uh, panel discussion. So if I may just start by introducing you to Professor uh, Dubo Shim, uh, who will be our first speaker. And he's the Dean of uh, Social Science College and Professor of Media and Communication at Sun Chin Women's University in Seoul, South Korea. He was previously assistant professor at the National University of Singapore and a visiting scholar at Duke University in the States. He received his bachelor's degree from Korea University and an MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in the States. He previously served as president of the Korea Speech, Media and Communication Association and research director at the Korean Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, the Korean Association of Southeast Asian Studies and the Korean Society for Journalism and Communication Studies. He has served as an editorial board member of many academic journals, including the International Journal of uh, Cultural Studies, Journal of Fandom Studies, and Asian uh, Communication Research. So before giving the floor to uh, Professor Shim, as you know, uh, this second session, we are really uh, discussing uh, um, how we can actually learn from uh, ROK in terms of especially the Hayu culture in uh, contributing to our efforts in amplifying ASEAN awareness and fostering ASEAN identity. So may I just give uh, the floor to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, um, good afternoon, um, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be a part of this um, very insightful symposium. Um, 
On the manner of sharing Korean uh, wave experiences, what I can do is to give my humble opinion. Uh, and also, please forgive me uh, for my limited uh, English proficiency. Um, I'm going to use my um, pre-designed uh, PowerPoint slides for my presentation. I titled it The Korean Wave Hallyu, Lessons the ASEAN May Learn From It. Um, excuse me. Okay. Uh, for the past 20 years, uh, the world has uh, acknowledged all things Korean uh, in the name of the Korean wave. Uh, in 2002, the American um, news agency AP uh, reported that Korean kimchi, all things Korean, from food and music to eyebrow shaping and shoe styles, are the rage across Asia. And then, um, <clears throat> although uh, at the time, uh, the, the scale and scope of Korean wave was much smaller than now, and then in year 2012, uh, the song and music video called Gangnam Style uh, became a huge uh, uh, wave across the world, and then uh, the American media and the rest of the world uh, began to report uh, widely and just recently, uh, in the uh, year 2020, when uh, the world was in fear of the outbreak of COVID-19 virus, uh, Korean film called Parasite uh, made a history by uh, winning the uh, Best Picture Award for the first time for foreign language film in, at the Academy Awards, and then just uh, a few days ago, a uh, Korean television drama series, Squid Game, uh, also earned uh, the first uh, non-American, uh, uh, as a non-American uh, actor in the, the productions to win the Emmy Awards. Uh, as you see uh, on the PowerPoint slides, the scope and scale of the Korean wave is getting bigger and deeper. Uh, for the past 20 years. And uh, based on uh, this achievement in the popular culture, anything Korean from uh, food and uh, tourism or uh, cosmetic uh, surgery and the language, uh, Korean wave is uh, getting bigger and, uh, as, and deeper. So uh, when we talk about uh, Asian, um, ASEAN, and also ASEAN uh, community building, uh, we have to ask, uh, when the ASEAN people began to talk about the ASEAN identity, uh, especially in the 1990s, uh, when uh, the West was uh, beginning to uh, kind of falter economically and politically, and and when uh, ASEAN economies, including uh, not only Japan, but also four dragon or four tiger economies, uh, such as Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and South Korea, uh, was uh, loom loomed huge, the world began to talk about the future will be the Asian age. And also, uh, some of the uh, Asian visionaries, like uh, Mahathir from uh, Malaysia and Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore began to um, uh, talk about the future is with us, Asia, because the uh, Western culture and Western uh, values are decadent already. So uh, we are, we Asians are going to take over the world with our own values. But um, there are also the criticism of these Asian uh, value uh, discussions and especially when economic crisis uh, spread over all over Asia in the uh, 1997 and onwards, the discursive foundation of the ASEAN community uh, faltered and lost. Then um, uh, around that time and right after the economic crisis uh, at, in the uh, uh, late 20th century, Korean popular culture and other um, nation, national uh, East Asian nations, popular culture uh, began to sweep across uh, Asia. So 
these days, uh, many scholars uh, begin to talk about uh, Asian uh, identity based on uh, the East Asian popular culture. Uh, when I call East Asia, I, I include both, uh, I embrace, it embraces both Southeast Asia and uh, Northeast Asia. When we uh, talk about East Asian popular culture, we have to uh, note that the Asian uh, uh, cultural experiences are based on uh, American influences. Um, for the past 100 years, uh, the United States uh, has been the leader uh, of the all kind of uh, fashion and cultures and also producer and also it has the biggest market. So uh, many Asian countries began to um, uh, learn from uh, America and try to imitate and uh, sometimes steal the images and ideas from America. The first runner was Japan. And for the past uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, Japanese manga and animation, especially Japanese manga and animation, uh, began to provide ideas and dreams uh, to the uh, children all over Asia. And also Hong Kong films from the 1970s to the 1990s. Uh, including Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, uh, Maggie Chung, uh, they uh, also provide uh, the entertainment to uh, the people in Asia in their adolescence and in their 20s. Then suddenly, for the past 20 years, uh, Korean wave uh, began to uh, become uh, a big influencer uh, to the rest of Asia. And these days, we are witnessing the China is rise, rising, uh, not only as a market, but also as a new uh, cultural producer. Uh, uh, for uh, the part of the uh, Southeast Asia, um, we have to um, understand and acknowledge that uh, largely Southeast Asia has been uh, receiving end of foreign cultures, not only from uh, North uh, East Asia, but also from the rest of the world. Um, 1990s is an interesting era and also important era so that uh, we have to uh, ponder uh, the political and economic and cultural um, uh, environment of the 1990s. Uh, it was largely characterized as a, a media globalization era. And when, uh, me when the people talked about media globalization, it's actually Americanization. Uh, so, uh, at the time, uh, the rest of, it, uh, uh, rest of the world uh, began to talk about the future uh, also will be conquered by American culture uh, based on uh, technologies and based on uh, big media companies which are uh, being bigger and bigger and more globalized. Asia uh, initially uh, tried to protect its own market uh, based on protectionist, traditional protectionist uh, market policies. But in the 1990s with the uh, rise of WTO era and uh, liberalization of the markets, uh, they uh, uh, had to uh, marketize and liberalize their own media industries. Uh, what about Korea? Uh, Korea's uh, response was the same with other Asian countries. But uh, what is interesting is that um, since the late 1980s, Korea began to democratize politically and uh, socially. And then um, uh, for the purpose of diversity, uh, Korea uh, government began to uh, expand more television channels uh, across the country. And then um, uh, traditionally, uh, entertainment industry was kind of largely ignored by the elite uh, graduates uh, in Korea, but uh, with democratization and also the college students who have a desire of uh, political reform, they uh, began to choose media industry as their alternative occupation and also uh, with the uh, lifting of the restrictions of, of foreign travel, foreign educated uh, artists uh, began to uh, go home to Korea to uh, to uh, 
provide their um, uh, ideas uh, to the audiences at home. And gradually, uh, people began to uh, have a respect for artists and culture, uh, culture industry uh, producers. And also, uh, companies like uh, Samsung or Hyundai or Daewoo, those J-Bar, so-called J-Bar companies, also funded uh, a lot in the uh, media markets. And as a result, the production values began to rise. So initially, in the 1990s, there was a huge competition among the commercial uh, television channels. But those competition initially yielded a kind of uh, more um, quality uh, in terms of production values. And also, if we uh, look at the Korean film industry, uh, also it had uh, uh, reform uh, uh, in, in its own uh, business uh, uh, performances. So uh, more rigorous audience research and marketing uh, recipes were introduced into the film industry. And also, uh, as in television, uh, more fresh talent and creative filmmakers uh, who have uh, education from uh, France or America the, for example, Bong Joon-ho, the director Bong Joon-ho, who uh, is behind the Parasite, is also a person who uh, debuted his career in the 1990s. And uh, more uh, funding uh, came into the uh, film industry, so theaters uh, have uh, more um, uh, better quality uh, viewing personalities. So, it, all those uh, factors uh, eventually lured more audiences to the uh, Korean film. And also, the, uh, after uh, 20 and or 30 years of economic growth, uh, uh, Korean people in general uh, began to have a, a bigger disposable income. And also, uh, based on their um, uh, disposable income, people began to uh, uh, try to enjoy um, newer uh, cultural taste and uh, more sophisticated uh, cultural uh, taste. And also government uh, began to have a, a, a bigger role. Um, uh, they began to uh, reform media policies and laws. So for example, um, censorship has been uh, more lenient and also uh, around uh, in 20, 2001, Korea became uh, the uh, Korea began to have the world's uh, fastest uh, internet infrastructure. So, uh, the government uh, also uh, play a, a kind of role to uh, boost the Korean media industry. Um, about the time, like uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, um, suddenly Korean television dramas and uh, bands and films uh, began to uh, kind of invaded the, the near, uh, nearby countries and suddenly uh, acquired a huge uh, popularity. Uh, many people began to analyze what are behind and Korean television dramas have unique storylines like uh, Confucian values, strong family values, and modest sexuality, which American television or Japanese uh, television drama uh, doesn't provide. So uh, there is a more uh, common uh, uh, emotional and cultural um, ground for Korean drama to be absorbed by the rest of Asia. And also many uh, Southeast East Asian audiences uh, refer uh, physical attractiveness of the Korean uh, actors and actresses as a, a factor behind their liking of Korean dramas. And also, uh, Korean uh, drama and film provide a kind of vision of developed society. So when uh, the audiences in um, uh, Myanmar and uh, Malaysia, they uh, often um, point out that Korean dramas and uh, television uh, shows provide modern lifestyles uh, which are 
different from America, different from Europe, but uh, very similar to Asia. So uh, modern but Asian. So it is easier to consume to uh, the Korean dramas. And also when uh, Squid Game or DP or the recent television uh, drama series, uh, The Extraordinary um, uh, Attorney Woo young uh, Korean drama uh, pro, uh, uh, expresses all kinds of social, social problems. So uh, when I uh, saw the YouTube comment uh, under the Squid Game, one Singaporean uh, audience commented that, wow, it is Korea. Only Korea can uh, show this kind of social problems. Uh, Singapore uh, cannot do that, I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, it is what I uh, read from the YouTube. Uh, and also, um, more and more Korean uh, drama and uh, uh, films provide uh, gen uh, representation of gender equality. So, different from other countries, um, the more Korean women are portrayed as a, a strong person. And it is not only uh, Korea's um, uh, uh, factors, but also um, across Asia, uh, like uh, Korean cases, many uh, Asian uh, countries began to liberalize their uh, media markets. So uh, they began to have more television channels. And then uh, in order to fill the vacuum, they began to uh, diversify import sources. So uh, tradition, uh, in addition to the traditional uh, strong content like uh, uh, American shows, Hong Kong films, and Japanese uh, animation, Korean content began to enter the rest of Asia. In case of Singapore, um, in around 2000 and 2001, um, Singapore began to have, uh, Singapore government began to uh, liberalize this uh, media market, uh, both in uh, the press and also in the uh, broadcasting. So the government allowed the SPH, which is a Singapore Press Holdings, uh, the one and only uh, newspaper uh, com company, to have its uh, own television channel. The, so it is called MediaWorks. And when the new television station began to uh, compete with the existing media corp, uh, their uh, main strategy, one of the main strategies is to use Korean drama as a bait to lure audiences. And uh, this strategy uh, uh, succeeded. So although in 2004, Media Works ceased operation and the Channel U of the Media U became a part of uh, Media Corp, uh, Channel U is still has a brand as a Korean drama channel. And also uh, Meteor Garden, the uh, 2001 Taiwanese television drama uh, based on uh, Japanese manga uh, began to uh, enjoy its popularity all across Asia. Uh, some of the uh, Filipino and Indonesian audiences began to confess that based on um, Meteor Garden, uh, they began to have uh, uh, taste for Northeast Asian looks. So it actually opened for uh, more Korean dramas to come to uh, Southeast Asia. And also, K-pop bands have a strategy to include Southeast Asian members so that uh, Nikun or, or um, Lisa, who are uh, Thai, peop uh, Thai uh, musicians, uh, based on uh, uh, their being included in the uh, K-pop uh, bands, uh, Thai audiences became uh, bigger fans of K-pop. So we have to ask whether uh, popular culture uh, promotes international dialogue. Uh, it is yes and no. Uh, we often say that uh, because of the cultural proximity between uh, Asian content or between Korean content and the Southeast Asian audiences, Korean wave is possible. But we have to think that Culture, the term cultural proximity is not a a priori condition, but is a matter of becoming. So uh, we, uh, when uh, the audiences in Southeast Asia uh, feel some kind of co-evilness when they watch Korean drama, it is 
uh, it is not because uh, the cultures of Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia are uh, initially or originally uh, same or similar, but uh, based on um, similar living standards or consumerist cultures, those uh, uh, results of the modernization uh, made uh, those kind of uh, cultural proximity. And also, um, many uh, when I interviewed many K-pop fans, uh, they um, confessed that they became more uh, close. They feel more closeness towards uh, Korean society. So this is one um, positive outcome of uh, popular culture. But uh, 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 we also feel some kind of um, intimate difference or strange similarity uh, in watching uh, other Asian uh, content. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons is because uh, all of the uh, Asian experiences uh, are based on uh, the original uh, media production know-how which was originated from the United States. As I said uh, in the beginning of, the, of this presentation, for the past 100 years, uh, America has been the main source of inspiration and also uh, the, 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 uh, the media production uh, know-how originator. And what's interesting is that um, many people uh, say that because of Netflix, Korean drama is becoming um, uh, bigger and more popular. But by this, we talk about um, media diversification in the world. But we have to be reminded that Netflix is an American company like uh, traditional uh, Hallyu Studios. So while we are uh, uh, enjoying media diversification, we uh, have to uh, continue to uh, pay attention to the American cultural hegemony. So um, when we consider uh, some lessons from the Korean wave that uh, ASEAN countries may learn, um, actually there are many uh, positive effects of the Korean wave uh, in addition to the negative effects. But uh, those uh, positive effects was not originally intended. Um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when Korean uh, television drama and uh, film producers uh, began to work hard, what they did was to focus their own domestic market from the invasion of the American content. But as time go by, uh, uh, Korean uh, content uh, acquired uh, a better uh, quality and better production values, and it was easy for them to uh, be exported to the rest of Asia and rest of the world. Uh, for example, Dejanggum, uh, many audiences here may remember the, the Jewel in the Palace or Dejanggum, which was a, a hugely popular Korean drama in around 2004 and 2005. The producers confessed that they did not intend Dejanggum would be popular not only in Korea but also outside of Korea. They just uh, thought Dejanggum or Jewel in the Palace is about tradition, is about traditional food. So they um, expected just a modicum of uh, success, very moderate success, but unexpectedly it became a huge uh, content around the world. So um, we have to be uh, reminded that there are unexpected uh, positive effects. For example, another thing is, another case is that uh, there was, um, uh, there used to be a, a Korean girl group called Wonder Girls. They uh, were very popular with his, some of the his songs. And one of the his songs was Nobody. Maybe you, many of you remember. And it was hugely popular in the Philippines in 2009. So some of the uh, Filipinos jokingly said that nobody was a national song of the Philippines. And by this, uh, the, the distance between Korean people and 
billion of people uh, begin to uh, smaller and smaller. And also another thing is that um, I, as a, a media scholar, I uh, from time to time interviewed uh, fans in Southeast Asia, uh, like uh, Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia. And uh, one of the Indonesian fans says that based on K-pop fandom, uh, she began to have friends, not only in Indonesia, but also Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and Korea. It is because on, on, by online chatting, when there is a concert in Singapore, but she wants to uh, visit Singapore, but uh, she has a limited um, uh, finances, then she contact uh, the same fan in Singapore and to allow her to stay at her home, at her uh, lodging for one night. By this way, K-pop connects audiences of different uh, nationalities. And also, um, uh, there are government rules, but uh, we have to be reminded that Korean wave is not a product of government. Korean government uh, try to support, but uh, there are some kind of uh, um, uh, harsh argument between the industry people and the government uh, people that uh, some of the uh, media industry in Korea says that because of government, there are, uh, because of government's excessive promotion, there is a, a negative effects of uh, bringing up anti-Korean wave. So as time go by, uh, the government also uh, began to be reminded that the more important thing is that support but not interfere. And also, uh, the Korean wave was possible because the government did not interfere with the content of the drama and the film. So there, were, there, there, were, there was a, a relative uh, freedom of expression in the Korean drama and Korean, other Korean media production. Um, some of the cultural scholars across East Asia and Southeast Asia began to talk about uh, we need some kind of inter-Asia referencing. It means that uh, instead of relying on uh, American knowledge and European experiences, we'd better cite uh, uh, other Asian experiences, knowledge more and more. And if we apply this idea to the media production, um, how about uh, uh, more co-production uh, of the uh, content uh, in the media and more uh, exchanging of ideas uh, between the media producers? And another thing is that um, when we talk about uh, more international uh, friendship, uh, we sometimes ignore uh, the minorities within our own land. Uh, look at the extraordinary attorney U U Young -woo. She is a patient of autism, but so in terms, uh, in a sense, she is a kind of minority. But uh, the Korean uh, television station uh, uh, bravely uh, uh, used her experience as a content of the media production. So um, these kind of uh, uh, diversity and democracy in terms of uh, uh, inclusion and also in terms of uh, free expression is important. Um, the Media Corp is uh, Singapore, uh, Rain Tree Pictures is a, a subsidiary of Singapore's uh, Media Corp, uh, Media uh, Corp uh, uh, television uh, Station and uh, Rain Tree Pictures is um, has been uh, co-producing uh, television uh, productions and films with other uh, Southeast Asian partners and uh, more Southeast Asian uh, media producers uh, do, uh, if possible, do the same uh, as what um, Rain Tree Pictures have done. Uh, this is all I have. Um, I have to talk about uh, democracy. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Kamsamida. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shim. I think that you have uh, provided us with a 
insightful context into the emergence of the K uh, wave, as well as you know uh, the lessons that we can draw um, in fostering ASEAN identity. In fact, I think one important observation that you make about the influence of foreign cultures that permeates uh, this region um, is certainly something that is not new because we have this history and experience of acculturation that has been a strength because it uh, facilitated the evolution of a pluralistic uh, community in Southeast Asia that has made us adaptable, resilient, and also appreciate and respect uh, diversity. And I think that you have, of course, bring up uh, some very uh, interesting suggestions there as well. I will leave it as that because um, perhaps later on, if we have the time, we'll probably go into some of the suggestions that we'll make in terms of like the kind of co-production of contents and the kind of referencings that we can do uh, in the, um, what you mentioned about the representation of minorities uh, in these uh, exchanges as well. So with that, thank you very much. If I now can just move on to Mr. Sean Ho, and if I can just briefly introduce him. Uh, Mr. Sean Ho is Associate Research Fellow, Regional Security Architecture Program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in the Nanyang Technological University. His research focus is on Korean Peninsula Affairs, and he was previously a researcher at the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in Singapore. He has also worked at Singapore's uh, National Security Coordination Secretariat under the Prime Minister's Office, as well as the Ministry of Defence. Sean obtained his Master's Degree in Asian Studies from uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies and his Bachelor's Degree from the Singapore Management University. He has also spent six months uh, studying at the Yongsei University Korean Language Institute. So with that, I give the floor to you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, organizers, uh, for kindly inviting me here. Uh, it's actually quite a special occasion for me. It's a uh, first on three fronts for me. Uh, my first overseas trip since the pandemic. My first time visiting Jakarta, actually, and of course, the first time visiting the ASEAN Secretariat. So thank you very much. Um, my background is really about Korean Peninsula issues and also about ASEAN-Korea relations. So I have quite a bit to say, but I'll try to keep it brief within uh, 10 minutes or so and talk more from personal experiences and observations rather than an academic viewpoint. I was given two questions. Uh, one is, what are the potential areas of cooperation that could better solidify a stronger sense of belonging and identity building in the region? Uh, basically, how to sort of feel a greater sense of ASEAN-ness or sense of ASEAN community. I think some of the speakers have already covered these points, but maybe I'll just add on one thing, is that, I mean, through through processes, crisis or hardships, actually people also get closer together. I mean, for people in this audience who have worked uh, long hours or you know, with colleagues or went through some crisis together, when you look back at that, there's a greater sense of community or identity that has emerged through those hardships. And I think uh, beyond the sense of uh, we-ness or ASEAN feeling, you know, hardships can also help to bring ASEAN closer together. And, and maybe from my own personal experience, uh, maybe just share a few personal anecdotes. Uh, I'm actually a Tottenham fan, Tottenham Hotspur, uh, for over 25 years. This is way before Sun Heung Ming joined, even way before Lee Yong Pyo joined uh, Spurs. But my point is that as, as a football fan, there is this imagined community. When you meet other fans from your, you know, supporting your same team, straight away you feel this sense of closeness with them. And secondly, also, I, I'm, I'm quite an explorer when it comes to food and, and chocolates, which I'm going to talk about a bit later, about specifically ASEAN chocolates. Um, that's something I will point out as well. But basically, from, from some of these background about my, my own identity, uh, I have some ideas about strengthening ASEAN identity as well, because obviously, common identity for ASEAN is a long-term process. It's not something that happens even within a short number of years. It can be government-supported, but perhaps not necessarily government-driven. And also it relies on what I call a whole-of-society approach that re involves really many different parts of society to come together and, and work at this. And especially to target the youth, I think in this day and age of social, social media, we really need to be creative in terms of how we reach out to the masses, 
how to create this sense of ASEAN identity because as has been alluded to in this conversation, it's a work in progress. It's, it's actually a never ending work in progress because identity also evolves over time. And certain things government should do, certain things government can do, but certain things government should not do as well and should leave it to the private sector or individuals. So Professor Dewey did talk about briefly an ASEAN you know, uh, logo on the passport, etc. Let me just take out my, my Singapore passport because it's the first time I'm actually using it. It's a, it's a new passport, by the way. So I had a quick look at it and there's actually no reference whatsoever to ASEAN or ASEAN logo or ASEAN flags inside. And maybe a suggestion, I'm not sure about the other ASEAN countries, is that maybe at the front of the passport, there can be an ASEAN logo, or at the back of the passport, there can be an ASEAN logo. Or if you know, nation states deem that too, too sensitive, which is understandable, maybe at the inner page of the last page, you know, there can be 10 ASEAN flags or an ASEAN logo. I think this also creates a sense of belonging or identity. Uh, that's one example. And of course, as an ASEAN citizen, there should come with responsibility as well, and also privileges, because as an average man on the street in a way, and you know, you would think that I'm an ASEAN citizen, what privileges do I have? You know, this, uh, this is a question to answer, uh, because there must be a sort of privilege given to people in the inside group, ASEAN, versus people who are not from ASEAN. Another thing is, uh, we talked about education. I mean, at least when I was in school, I don't remember there was a lot of content about ASEAN. I think this is something that at least government level, besides issue of a passport and having logos, etc. Governments can also coordinate among themselves to kind of do more when it comes to promoting ASEAN from a very young age and, and a kind of consistent content in curriculum from schools. And in, in terms of uh, non-government uh, initiatives, actually, uh, food is something that is very dear to all of us. Of, of course, lunch is coming up soon, I know. And really, ASEAN is so diverse. There's so much delicious food from so many different countries and provinces. I don't think uh, we can ever savour all the food in our lifetime, you know. How to promote this ASEAN identity through food, again, it's a soft aspect. It's, it's something that is easy to chew on, literally and figuratively. You know, and, and also in universities across ASEAN, I wonder whether there are many ASEAN student clubs where you know, the focus is really about understanding ASEAN, promoting ASEAN. Um, I, I think more can be done on that front as well. And, and as I mentioned, I'm a big football fan, right? So it was also got me thinking, this is something that probably the government should not get involved with. But whether there can be an annual like ASEAN versus Europe football match, you know, it can be... Um, something that involves one team or ASEAN nationals, one team or European nationals, or a mix of both. And it, this could be also uh, for a good cause. Whatever money that is raised can go towards charity. And these are the kind of things, the softer aspects, because football, I mean, I'm, I'm a football fan. There are probably some football fans here as well. You know, it, it really reaches out to big audiences nationwide, region-wide, you know, and, and you identify it with them because have your country representative in that football team playing against you know, the best players in Europe. Uh, so that's again an, a suggestion, you know, to, to build this sense of uh, identity or community, uh, baby steps. Huh? The second question I was given was what can we learn about awareness raising from ROK with its vibrant Hallyu culture? Can an ASEAN wave be in the making? I mean, I just wanted to do a quick poll here, just a raise of hands. How many people in this room think that the awareness of Korea has actually increased over the last 10 years. Um, you know, whether you're from ASEAN or not from ASEAN, maybe you can have a show of hands. Who thinks that the awareness of Korea has increased dramatically, in fact, over the last 10 years? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, uh, again, this point is showing that Korea's uh, branding or international profile has really risen tremendously over the last decade or two, and strongly in part due to the Korean wave. I think no doubt Many people have their first contact with Korean society, culture, through music, drama, you know, food, etc. And no doubt, Korean soft power is, is very strong. And I think the key thing is that foreigners are attracted to it naturally. Nobody forces them to kind of watch Korean drama, eat Korean food, learn Korean language. But this is where the beauty of it is that people naturally get attracted to it. Of course, in ASEAN, the context is completely different because, as you know, ASEAN is so diverse, it's so different. Korea is largely a homogeneous country or culture, but that's it. There are still points that we can learn from each other. Um, there was once a friend who asked me, Sean, do you, 
consider yourself a Korea boo. Apparently, there's this term, maybe it's uh, youngsters, people in their teens or 20s things, uh, where people describe non-Koreans who are obsessed with Korean culture, particularly K-pop or K-dramas, as Korea boo, you know, B-O-O, -O, basically. And I wonder whether there could be an ASEAN boo also in future, you know? I mean, it's something to think about or work towards. And uh, how to steer this sense of curiosity about ASEAN, both among ASEAN nationals and also among uh, foreigners, not from the ASEAN region. Uh, Korea, of course, has had great success in both soft exports and hard exports, soft being you know, cultural, drama, creative contents, hard being physical, uh, you know, consumer goods, automobiles, electronics, etc. And how, likewise, can ASEAN work towards exporting both its soft and hard aspects internationally, beyond ASEAN and also within the region? I think these are some of the things uh, to think about because in, in terms of soft power or ASEAN wave or Korean wave, I mean, there's a huge range of endless possibilities. You can talk about food, music, drama, tourism, language, sports, arts, you name it, you know, you can have co-productions. Uh, in fact, recently there was a uh, Singaporean-Korean joint movie production. Uh, I don't think it's out yet. It will probably come out at the Busan uh, Film Festival. But the point is that these joint productions allow uh, people from both sides to see a part of them, basically somebody from their country in the film, in the drama, some of the uh, locations, it could be in ASEAN countries or in uh, Korea itself, and they can identify. So it's, it's quite interesting. I think more can be done in terms of ASEAN-Korea joint uh, productions in that sense. And I think also the beauty about the Korean wave is that, um, again, people are attracted to it because it's of high quality. So likewise, for ASEAN to have an ASEAN wave, the quality really matters. You know, people must be naturally curious or attracted to it because it is something unique. It is something that has not been really seen elsewhere. It does push certain boundaries. And I think the authenticity of ASEAN culture or ASEAN um, content needs to be there. It, it shouldn't be a watered down, uh, you know, foreigner friendly kind of thing. You know, like when you go to a restaurant of a foreign cuisine in your own country, sometimes you're like, oh, the food here is not really how it's like when I went to that country. It's a bit watered down. It's not as spicy. It's not real. People want the real thing. People want authentic uh, content. And I think Korea has managed to do that very successfully in the sense that its, its cultural contents, its movies, its dramas, it's not exactly toned down for a foreign audience, but yet it somehow attracts or appeals to their their heartstrings, and likewise for ASEAN to do so, it also must come up with content that is very authentic and, and real, and like Professor Shim mentioned, uh, to also include minorities in the region, of which there are many different aspects of minorities. Um, I think fundamentally also, it requires a bit of a mindset change, at least coming from Singapore, growing up in Singapore. I mean, my honest view is that sometimes in Singapore, we tend to look far away, you know, to the US, to the UK, to Europe. We need to have this mindset change where, you know, we need to look more in our neighbourhood, the region. What are we strong in? What are the things that, you know, we ourselves uh, treasure or want to promote? And this mindset shift towards a greater ASEAN-ness, I think is also key. So I'll just have a brief remarks in that sense and uh, I look forward to further discussions. Uh, and of course, I hope this is the first of many trips to Jakarta and the ASEAN Secretariat in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sean Ho. And um, I, you mentioned about Korean bull and was wondering whether an ASEAN bull can happen. I, but I was further wondering whether ASEAN Korea bull can happen, you know in the future, because I think um, that also speaks to what uh, Professor Shim talked about, uh, co-production, the potential of co-production of contents, I think that's where you bring out the best of both uh, ASEAN and ROK. So thank you for your uh, very personable uh, reflection and views. Um, now we are going to move on to the last uh, speaker who has um, done a pre-recording for us. But let me just read out um, a bit of his bio here. Uh, Associate Professor Gui Tak Lee, um, 
received his bachelor's in English language and literature from Seoul National University, South Korea. After completing his military service in the Republic of Korea Air Force, he received his master's in communication from Seoul National University. He has a PhD in cultural studies from George Mason University. And since uh, 2014, he has been teaching at George Mason University in Korea. And he's an expert of popular music, media studies, globalization of culture, and especially K-pop. Now, if I may just invite you to take a listen to his pre-recorded uh, interventions on what he thinks uh, ASEAN could do to draw inspirations from the Hayu culture. Thank you. Hi. My name is Gutek Lee. I am from British Mason University of Korea, located in Songdo, Incheon, South Korea. And I'm really happy to be invited, and I'm really honored to be invited by this symposium on ASEAN identity and the strengthening ASEAN and South Korea cooperation. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, short speech. And uh, I actually got a two questions for this cooperation between ASEAN and Republic of Korea and also the Hallyu phenomenon and the possibility of globalization of ASEAN culture. So I would like to give a brief uh, opinion about those questions that I got from uh, the uh, symposium. So first of all, uh, the first question I got is the, what are the potential areas of cooperation that could better solidify a stronger sense of belonging and identity building in the region. Since I'm a cultural studies and media studies scholar, I would like to focus on those fields rather than politics or economy specifically. After the regional and global success of K-pop and Hallyu, there have been several efforts actually of cultural exchange between ASEAN countries, I mean the Southeast Asian countries and South Korea. For instance, as many of you know, there are a number of K-pop idols from Southeast Asian country in various K-pop bands. Maybe uh, Lisa from Thailand, a globally known K-pop idol from the girl band Blackpink is a good example. Yes, just like I mentioned, she's from Thailand, became a member of one of the most famous K-pop girl band, Blackpink, and is now really a popular and even celebrity worldwide. Thanks to her popularity, of course, uh, Blackpink has uh, been successful in drawing attention from the international audience, but also uh, her popularity makes some Korean fans and Korean audience to have interest about Thailand, their, their culture, and their society as well. So you can see how the culture, the actual player in K-pop or other like Korean culture industries from Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN countries, can attribute the better understanding between each other. Also, some experts and industry insiders who have worked for Korean culture industries have moved to Southeast Asia countries and worked with local culture industries people to produce their own like band, their own TV series and their own films, etc. So this is actually the industry of uh, cooperation between South Korea and many different Asian countries actually happening uh, recently. Therefore, I think these kinds of cultural exchange it's very helpful and should increase more, even more than now. Though Korean pop culture, popular culture has been enjoyed and loved by Southeast, Southeast Asian audience, even since the late 1990s or the early 2000s until present, there have, been, there have not been enough opportunities for South Korean people to know and understand more about Southeast Asian culture. I know Coffee's Korean Foundation for International Cultural Exchange and other like Korean government-based institutions have done meaningful jobs for this cultural exchange between South Korea and 
other like Asian uh, ASEAN countries, I mean the Southeast Asian countries. However, if there will be more cultural events and more like cultural cooperation, both from the industrial sense and both from cultural sense, could be held together, it will surely contribute to build a stronger shared identity as East Asian, including, I mean, what I mean by East Asian is both Northeast Asian and Southeast Asian countries. Therefore, more corporations that organize and hold cultural events or other cultural cooperation hosted both by South Korea and South Asian country and also both in public and private sector will be really necessary to make this shared identity. And now um, second question, what can we learn about uh, awareness uh, raising from uh, Popular of Korea, South Korea, with its vibrant Hallyu culture, can an ASEAN wave be in the making? Uh, I think it is very interesting, but very difficult question to answer. But I believe ASEAN culture, I mean the culture from Southeast Asian countries, also has its big potential to globally uh, known, even outside its own region, just like how. Korean pop culture has successfully done uh, since the late 1990s till present, like about like 25 years ago or so. For instance, uh, some of you may know this case that a boy band from Philippines called SB19 got noticed by the US Billboard chart, some international audience, which uh, is a co-produced group by the Korean producers and creators and also the local Filipino producers and creators. So you can see how they have been creating their own awareness outside its, its own local market as well as outside its own regional market but a more global known market based on the cultural cooperation between Korea and the local uh, Philippine industry. I think it may be necessary to find how ASEAN countries can access the possible global audience and what. Of course, not all the things were thoroughly intended and only this, these aspects can explain all the reasons, but Hallyu, which is the global success of Korean popular culture, is based on the way Korean culture industries have used the newest media technologies of each period. I mean, the newest video technologies of 2000s, technologies of 2010s and technologies of 2020s and could draw attention from the global youth. This is very important because if you can successfully draw attention from the youth, the younger generation, then the longevity of the popularity of a certain culture can last long. I mean, if you like certain music when you are young, you might be still a fan of that kind of music or culture from that country, even you grow a bit older, like 30s or 40s. And we can see the very evidence that fans of Hallyu in the early 2000s in many East Asian, Southeast Asian countries are still fond of Korean culture. And their kids, their children are also becoming the fan of Hallyu or K-pop which means that both parents and children can enjoy uh, the Hallyu culture, Korean culture, and it can also be the means for them to communicate with each other, the younger generation and the older generation. So I think it is very important. Also, Korean culture industries have been open to global foreign country, cultures and accepted and blended them with their own culture without much hesitation. They have been really open. This attitude, along with the usage of media technologies, really important in this global success of Hallyu and can be a clue for ASEAN culture, Southeast Asia country culture, to be globalized. Open to the technologies, try to use the technologies and open to accept foreign culture and try to blend them with their own its own local culture to create new something different from 
the foreign culture as well as the local culture that existed before. Hope my answers for these two questions would work and would be delivered to you. Thank you for inviting me again for this uh, symposium and hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. So th thank you very much to all our panelists. And I think that uh, it's now time for us to take some questions or if you have any uh, comments or views that you would like to make. So without further ado, if I can just invite uh, anyone from the floor who would have any questions. Uh, I have one hand there. I just want to see if there's anyone else. Okay, we will take uh, from, uh, from over there, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask the question. Uh, if I may, may uh, can I uh, take off my mask to speak clearly? Uh, yes, please. So um, I think it's in order for me to also introduce myself some part in Korean, because we're talking about Korean culture also here. Uh, uh, my name is Luisa. Uh, I'm from Abang None, Jakarta Selatan, representative for Indonesia. I think I would like to ask um, about culture, about Korean culture specifically, because uh, there is a very good point from um, Professor uh, Gyutak Lee that he said both parents and children are now fans of the Korean entertainment, which is something that actually happened in my uh, household now. My mom is a very big fan of um, BTS. She's a very a big army. She would consider herself that. And to the point that there's somewhat of a parasocial relationship between her and the band itself, because now she adopts Korean culture within her lifestyle. She now eats japchae, and she's actually trying to make her own kimchi uh, per month now so it's very interesting what's happening so it's and and for me it's a it's it's one thing thing to break into a market and it's another thing to create a market itself which is what the koreans are doing right now so my question would be uh how was the process do you think that now korea's whole identity is so popular that their uh lifestyle is also a commodity uh of, of some sense and uh, across the world so much that it's uh that even those who are skeptical of it uh, at, at the first place, because my mom wasn't necessarily a fan of the Koreans, and now uh, she's a big fan of it, now would spend, I guess, thousands of dollars, for lack of a better word, to consume it, the content and have a, this undying hunger. Because if we draw a comparison to American culture, we also have creative uh, content creators in America. For example, we have, when we speak about minority, there's a movie called Enigma where uh, someone of an autistic spec, uh, who has an autistic uh, spectrum is also the ones who helped finish or uh, ended the World War II. Uh, modern civilization and evil medieval civilization is also shown in uh, series like Game of Thrones and the Avengers. So do you think all of this happened organically and not by design so that we somewhat hope for the best for the market to love the contents? Or is it because the intensity that the Koreans have in producing their market that makes us love Korean culture so much that we somewhat imbue it in our own lifestyle uh, across the world. I think that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Professor Shim to give your thoughts on this. Thank you, um, thank you very much for, uh, very, um, for your question in a very uh, friendly atmosphere. Um, I'm not sure whether I understood your question exactly, but um, uh, it is not too, it is not very uh, it is not very easy to answer your question. But um, I uh, I also uh, have kept on thinking how come uh, Korea uh, became uh, a regional um, powerhouse in terms of cultural production uh, in some in some sense suddenly because it only happened. Uh, in the 20 or 30 years ago. But um, uh, one thing is that um, Korea is a country who, which has experienced uh, both democratization and industrialization uh, very fast and within the same uh, period of time. And then there are people who wants, want to uh, express it into a text, into a content. And there are uh, one of the... Um, 
uh, I don't want to um, become, I don't want to uh, feel like a, a Korean patriot, but um, I think there is one thing that, um, the one positive thing about Korean culture is that there is a desire to, for a perfection, desire to be perfect. And uh, in, there are many people who say that uh, Korea is a country which is um, comparable to he or hell. Uh, it means there is a huge intensity, huge rivalry, huge competition. But in some sense, those uh, negative things can convert it into a positive thing in terms of production, in terms of um, uh, production which can be almost uh, perfect. So there is nothing like perfection, nothing like a perfect cultural expression, but there is a desire to be as possible as to be near to the perfection. I think there, there is uh, one thing, uh, uh, the Korean cultural production uh, can be as, as successful as today. Uh, so I hope um, I can <laughs> be of help to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shim. If I may just ask um, uh, Mr. Sean to weigh in as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I always find it very interesting sometimes in Singapore where I you know, walk in the supermarket and I see something that has Korean words on it. And then on closer inspection, I realize that it's actually not from Korea or it's not made in Korea. But whoever designed it has to put the Korean word there because it signifies that, oh, this is a good quality product. This is attractive. And even though sometimes for people who don't read Korean, I, I can read so I, I can see what it means. But for people who don't understand it, it, it really doesn't make sense what the Korean words say on it. And also sometimes it has reached a point where some countries, they actually you know, brand that product, for example, like Shingo Pear is from Korea, right? And there's Korean words on it. But actually, if you look deeper, it's actually not from Korea. You know, the fruit is not from Korea. So this is a, it's a, it's a clear sign that companies are also trying to leverage on the Korea brand or images or signals that signify something to do with Korea to kind of reach that kind of uh, target audience. Uh. Um, maybe a, a side story I've used the opportunity to share, if you don't mind. I, I was talking about my interest in chocolates, right? So actually, ASEAN has a lot of chocolates, you know, because it comes from the chocolate beans, right? And Indonesia is actually the world's uh, third largest producer of chocolate beans. So interestingly, I, I, I was given this chocolate bar. There's a pamphlet inside which I brought along with me by a Korean friend. So my Korean friend came to Indonesia for a business trip, bought these and gave it to me and said, Sean, you must try this. This from Indonesia is so good, you know? And I was like, okay, I didn't know about it. And I tried it. It was really good. I won't see the brand now because I'm not here to advertise for them, right? You know? But the point is that ASEAN has good quality products. Sometimes we don't know about it, even among ASEAN member states. And actually, something like chocolates, you know, you don't have to kind of say, oh, made in Indonesia, made in Malaysia, made in Thailand, of which even Thailand or Vietnam, they have actually very good quality chocolates, which I've tried before. You know, uh, tendency is like some Europeans, they, they came here and they tried the chocolates and they realized that they can improve, so they created their own brand. But ASEAN people ourselves can learn these skills, can create these brands, and also it doesn't have to be just made in Indonesia. It could be Indonesian chocolate beans made in another country and then with uh, expert chocolate makers from another country as well. It can be a joint ASEAN can, uh, effort and the brand can actually say made in ASEAN. You know, things like that to create a sense of identity, a sense of pride in ASEAN made products. Um, I think that kind of pride in Korea made products, I feel it, I see it. You know, it's very strong and, and also, like Professor Shim said, the, the, the strive for perfection or improvement you know, how to make it truly yours. I think chocolate in that way is also one example of many examples where you can have a made in ASEAN product that we are proud of and the world itself sees value and interest in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, just hearing from the two of you, one key takeaway is really that when we look at the Hayu culture, the K culture itself, one of the hallmark is really that it speaks to quality authenticity as what you mentioned as well and then of uh, what uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Shim mentioned about perfection. I think these are the key ingredients and of course the follow-up question to this is uh, how can we make the ASEAN identity or awareness more authentic 
more uh, genuine, uh, more um, of a certain quality, and embrace that um, spirit of perfection. So I, I think that's something to think about as well. I would like to ask, um, yes, Professor Derwi, you have the floor for the next uh, question or comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations. Um, uh, I'm also a, a late uh, developer in terms of uh, Korean popular culture, and uh, I've, now I've enjoyed watching selective Korean dramas. I have to say that um, I'm not into K-pop very much, but uh, maybe my age. Yeah, but I enjoyed that uh, drama that focuses on a lot of political social criticism, so like fiery priests and things like that. So I'm still looking forward for more of that. But uh, the question is, when we're talking about, you know, what can we learn from from South Korea, from Korea for ASEAN? One thing is very clear: Korea. Uh, it's a single country, and culturally is fairly homogeneous. Now, ASEAN already very diverse, and within ASEAN, each country, you know, Indonesia, you know, is, is extremely diverse. And uh, for each of the ASEAN countries to follow the Korean wave, maybe an Indonesian wave, a Thai wave, it's still a struggle because when we think about, you know, what is Indonesian food? There's no such thing as an Indonesian restaurant in Indonesia. You will not find it anywhere. There'll be Sundanese restaurant, there'll be Padang restaurant, there'll be Manado restaurant, and so on. There's no such thing, you know. And, and, and so you only find Indonesian restaurant outside of Indonesia. And I think that, that there's, you know, the regional identities and so on. So clearly, when we are talking about how to promote an ASEAN wave and so on, it cannot really be uh, organically grown. Unlike, you know, like in Korea, when you say, you know, the government should not be too interventionist, just support but not drive it. But as you know, in the, the first panel, the ASEAN identity itself is, just cons it is very much a constructed identity and we are still trying to discover it. And, uh, and, and clearly, uh, it would be difficult simply to let the social forces you know, uh, to go about it. And so um, I just maybe, maybe I, like, I like to challenge this, you know, that, you know, there is clearly a role, not just for national governments, but for the ASEAN body, the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN Foundation, and so on. And, but maybe, you know, you don't want it to be uh, uh, a move that is more like a government-driven promotion, which is which I'm sure will be extremely boring and nobody will want to watch it. <laughs> so, so here, you know, how would you strike a balance, you know? It has to be constructed in a way, so policy has to play a role there, you know, governments have to play a role, but at the same time, you know, it will have uh, to be interesting and not, and not the usual government spiel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Derby. Um We have a question, I think, from uh, online as well. It's from one of our dearest friends uh, from Brunei Darussalam who represents the uh, SOMCA, which is our senior officials are responsible for culture and the arts. So if I may just uh, read out his question here. So he would like to congratulate our speakers for a very insightful presentation. I would like to comment according to cultural sociology and history. Our region has experienced cultural assimilation, identity formation and cultural expressions for ages based on the Indian diaspora. It shaped us into adopting, for example, the mudra, hand gestures, based on the Anjali mudra or the samba. Um, ASEAN identity and its cultural expressions can only be seen by our future generations. Our discussions today were based on the popular culture. My question is, can our speakers agree to the statement that the creative industries also shape our identity, especially uh, ASEAN identity? So with that, perhaps I give the floor uh, first to uh, Mr. Sean, and then after that to Professor Shim. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is quite a complicated question, uh, but let me try to digest it and try to answer it as best as I can. Uh, I think identity is always an evolving thing. It is always sort of like a push and pull factor, action, reaction, and, and you don't really know what you know, impact there will be. For example, you talked about a film, 
you know, Professor Shim talked about Tejangam, you know, uh, jewel in the palace, you know, and how it received the kind of reaction that was not expected. So basically, governments or entities can create something, can produce something, but they don't really know the outcome. You really don't know. It's like elections, right? You can have polls, but you don't really know what's going to happen until the election results are out. And, and therefore, when it comes to creative industries' uh, impact on identity, on ASEAN identity, I think uh, we should let the creative industry do what it's best at, which is to push boundaries, to create new content. And in that context, governments should intervene as, as less as possible because, as Prof. Dewey said, you know, when governments step in, they tend to make it quite boring, uh, frankly speaking, you know, because it's like, oh, this is too sensitive, oh, this is you know, culturally inappropriate, and by the time you tick off all the things that you cannot do, you're really left with nothing much else. Um, and, and also, I think the key emphasis is that ASEAN uh, is diverse, no doubt about it. Even within each country, for a big country like Indonesia, it's very diverse. And as, there's no point in trying to say that, oh, let's create a homogeneous ASEAN identity because that doesn't exist and probably cannot exist. There may be one or two or three aspects where everybody can agree on. For example, like we are a rice-eating region. That's something we can agree on. You know? But other than that, I think we should let it be diverse, let it run, let you know, there be emphasis on this diversity and strength in, in diversity. Um, I think those are my, my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think Mr. Sean has um, provided a very insightful um, uh, answer to this uh, question, and I also agree with him. And um, if I understand uh, creative industry as a commercial industry, uh, yes, commercial industry uh, is able and has been able to shape all kinds of identities uh, in the past and today and the future. Um, I'm also a generation who have watched uh, and listened to Elvis Presley, uh, Beatles, and Michael Jackson, although I didn't mean to be uh, uh, pro-American or something like that. I, in, my, in me, uh, there is an uh, American mind. And, and also, I have a Korean mind. And also, uh, the more I uh, have ASEAN friends, I have uh, ASEAN mind. Um, in relation to the government role, the most important thing is the government has to provide uh, the, the field in which uh, commercial and creative players compete fairly. This is what the government has to do the most. And I think uh, Korean government has, uh, to a certain uh, extent, did that role. Or, um, and as um, some of the, uh, the we and other people says, if there is an excessive promotion by the government, it usually leads to negative uh, outcomes. So uh, there is also always a push and pull between the government and the market, the public sector and the private sector. And all these um, dynamic mechanisms eventually shape uh, all kinds of identity. This is what, what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Professor Shim. So um, I think that we are uh, coming to the end of uh, this session and I would like to once again thank our panelists and likewise the participation of our audience, uh, both online and from the floor. Uh, the, a key takeaway, I, I, if I can just summarize here from this session, is that for a, for a dynamic ASEAN identity to flourish, I think it really takes two hands to tango. Uh, in the sense that you want to make it genuine and authentic and also at the same time that um, and of course um, with perfection and with that quality there but it must be something as I think alluding to what Professor Derby has mentioned there it cannot be just generated top down but it has to be driven bottoms up as well and I think that's something that we hope that conversation uh, will continue um, and involve people beyond just ASEAN officials and speakers uh, and academics and all that, but go beyond to the men in the streets. And I think the other point is that it's equally very important for us to draw the strengths from the ASEAN ROK cooperation to see how we can enhance. Um, and as what uh, Mr. Sean mentioned, you know, you have the K Boo, uh, what about the ASEAN Boo, and what about ASEAN Korean Boo? Um, that's something that we um, could be looking and working towards. So with that, thank you very much. And may I just invite you to give a round of applause 
to our two panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers of panel discussion too, and thank you, Jonathan, for your engaging moderation. We will now take a break for lunch. Uh, lunch boxes are served outside of the Nusantara Hall where the snack boxes were earlier. Uh, since it is now uh, 1.40, we will have one hour lunch break, so we hope that we can resume by, four, uh, by 2.40. And so for everyone uh, that will be attending the breakout sessions later, we invite you to come back at 2.40 so we can discuss the breakout session. Thank you. Ha uh, have a good lunch. Also, like to announce that uh, this is the end of our of the session that is uh, streamed online. So we would also like to thank those that have uh, listened and joined us in the morning session. Thank you very much.